welcome back. It is the Sunday Puncher Podcast. I'm your host, Angelo. I got Tom here with me. Tom, say hello. Tom Cody here. Always good to be on. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Lex over there, say hello. What's good, everybody? All right. That's Lex calling in from his Sony Ericsson flip phone. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh the the wait for a new mic from lex is going to be shorter than you guys realize but anyway thank you so much for joining us on another edition of our podcast we had um a lot we have a lot to talk about and it's so much that we're gonna do two parts for this episode because i don't think we knowing us if we try to do it all in one podcast we were either gonna do a bad three hour episode, or we can do two good three hour episodes. I mean, like, what do you guys want? Okay. For any of you guys who've left reviews for our podcast and they've been good reviews. Thank you so much. I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, for those of you over the course of our existence who have left great reviews for us, we really appreciate that. Um, anybody who's message with feedback and, or praise or whatever it is, you know, thank you so much. Let's jump into things, guys. Andy Ruiz overcame some early adversity against Chris Ariola before he ultimately settled in, made his adjustment, and got a wide decision victory. Now, I'm going to ask you guys this first question, all right? And that is, did Andy Ruiz look like he's ready to get back in the title mix to you? Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's a funny way to frame the first question. I mean, it is a good way to frame our initial response because, like, I think when it comes down to it, if you look at Ruiz having a little bit of a harder time than some people might have thought, did this really come off worse than Fury against Valin when, you know, he had that horrible cut, got rocked in the 12th, or, you know, in turn, Wilder getting, you know, stopped by Fury, or Joshua getting stopped by you know, Ruiz. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you're talking about is Ruiz ready to get back in the title picture, I think he's still without question. One of those top four guys. I mean, it's really, you can't make a better case than Ruiz as being the next guy at that level. And he would be a more worthy title challenger for anyone else, you know, outside of Wilder, Fury, and Joshua facing each other. So, I mean, he's still definitely there even if he does seem to be a little bit of a work in progress in terms of, you know, his body changing and, uh, you know, learning a few new tricks in his camp. What about you, Lex? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think a mistake a lot of people make with, with, with well, first off, I'll go with this fight is that Ariola hasn't really ever been like, he's a tough dude. Like he's been stopped before, but it's not like, He's been stopped cold and knocked out. And I think because uh, Andy had the stoppage over AJ, people kind of went into this thinking that he would just roll right through uh, Chris. But you, Chris is not the guy you roll through, for one. And, and the second point I, I'd like to make is one thing I love about, about PBC matchmaking is they really give guys the opportunity to, to get ready and have belief that, like, this is their big shot. They get featured in the all-access or 24-7 show or whatever you want to call it. And, like, you go in with full confidence, no short camp, no worrying about, you know, whether or not the judges are going to screw you or, or just or is the PBC going to screw you? And we, we've seen it a bunch. Uh, Hellenius and uh, Kaunaki, Kironi Davis and uh, Durrell. Um, per, it's Peralta and Harrison, right? That just happened? Perella. But I don't think we Perella, need uh, a recap of the last... Six months Whatever. of Fox the, the cards. Is, like, there's all these matchups that people go into thinking it'll be super one sided, and and at the end of the night, it's like, wow, that was a really good fight. And so, um, yeah, I say all that to say I think Andy is ready for the top level. I mean, maybe not a Fury, AJ, or Wilder, but everyone below those three, I, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it. Yeah. So first of all, they call it Fight Camp, not All Access or Twenty Four Seven. Fight um, Camp. Sorry. Second, uh, Tom, good point. I think that's one of the major takeaways from the fight is that we are seeing a work in progress with Andy Ruiz. We're seeing a guy who I think it's safe to say has never approached the sport of boxing in the way that he's doing right now. And you can't take that lightly because there are 
lifelong habits that I'm sure he's had where he has not looked spectacular in the past. And he's changing those and he's doing things different. And like we are seeing a, a, an eating, sleeping, breathing, living, boxing Andy Ruiz. And I don't think we've ever seen that before. I think it's safe to say that there are some fights where he probably didn't even train for the fight. I mean, it wouldn't be anything more than like, ah, I hit a couple of minutes, I sparred a little bit, and that's about it. And we're now seeing an Andy Ruiz who, if he can, what well, maybe we'll see what it looks like when he becomes a guy who is breathing boxing and is in day in and day out looking for just how he can make, be a little bit better than the day before, which is clearly how Canelo has gotten to the point that he's gotten before. I mean, the growth we've seen with Canelo from the early days of fighting Matthew Hatton until now is just been phenomenal. And in my mind, one of, or my memory, the growth that he's shown has been some of the best growth I've ever seen in the sport of boxing. But like to speak to the question of like, well, is he ready to get back in the title mix? I think the answer is absolutely. And like, it's one of the things like, this is a trending up Andy Ruiz. Like, he had a little struggle in the first, in the second round, and we can't ignore that. There was some struggle there. When he said after the fight, I was rusty, there's no doubt about it. You watch that fight, it's like, yeah, I, yeah, I'm with you, man. And if you don't think he looked rusty, I don't know what you were looking for. That was a rusty Andy Ruiz. He got caught early, but, but boxing is about adjustments. And we saw in Ruiz's first fight with Anthony Joshua, Joshua had to adjust. He couldn't do it. And of course, you could say, well, well, you know, he had no legs, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the case may be, no adjustment there. He lost the fight. Deontay Wilder got hit early in that fight with Tyson Fury. Legs appeared to not be there. Couldn't make the adjustment. Ruiz, you know, obviously he wasn't facing Tyson Fury. He wasn't facing himself, but he was facing a guy in Chris Ariola, and he was able to make that adjustment. And you could chalk that up to maybe Ariel is not as good as Andy Ruiz, or you could say that Andy Ruiz is that kind of fighter. He's a good fighter that when faced with adversity, he's going to make the adjustments, and he did. And that shows me that we are seeing a better version of Andy Ruiz because I've seen him fight in the past, and I think I'm one of the people who's way lower on him than anybody else. And what I saw last night was something that I didn't see against him against Joseph Parker when he lost to Joseph Parker. I didn't see an adjustment in that fight. I saw a guy who just tried to do a little bit better, a little bit harder, a little bit more of what he was already doing that wasn't quite working as well as he needed it to be so that he could win that fight. So I liked what I saw last night from Andy Ruiz. I 100% think this guy should be in a title fight in the coming future. But naturally, I understand if that's not the case, because like, let's be real here. We are, we could have a situation where all the titles are going to be tied up in fights. If that's the case, cool. We, there are other fights for him to have. But after the fight, I think uh, this kind of threw every, a, a wrench into the situation when the scorecards were read and they were like, kind of like really wide. So let me ask you guys a question. Do you guys agree that the, the cards were too wide? Or do you think that uh, something else about it? Lex, what do you think? I mean, I thought they were like a little wide, but uh, there was a lot of close rounds and, you know, I don't know. I, the right guy won at the end of the day. You know, I do, I, I do feel for Chris. And I think Chris will, you know, he, he'll get props out of this from boxing writers, boxing media, and he'll probably get another big shot. Uh, I don't know what happened there. I think Lex dropped off. Tom, you want to just fill in? Yeah, I, I mean, same sentiment. Uh, it's, it's like the classic example of the rounds were competitive, but if you really like were paying attention, there was a pretty clear winner for basically every round. I mean, you know, it was the case of a fight, you know, just, and I'm just being from a scoring standpoint, it's the case of a fight where you had a knockdown early, but the other guy was pretty much winning all of the rounds. So, I mean... I think uh, on on my scorecard, I would get. I gave. Um, I actually did score the fight. Uh, Ariel only two rounds, um, and I think there was a third round which I would consider a swing round. When he, I think it was the sixth when um, 
Ariola seem to sting Ruiz again, but you know, that's a pretty wide scorecard, but I, I'm not really surprised about like the reaction of the fans in the stand. I've gone to enough live fights and I've seen this exact thing play out so many times where like a fight's competitive, but from a scoring standpoint, you, you know, will keep giving the rounds to the guy who is, you know, more decisive in the rounds. Um, you know, and that's what happened here, but uh, just to, to frame it slightly differently, I mean, uh, Ruiz, or excuse me, Ariola definitely won based on expectations coming in. You know, there was this whole talk of uh, Ruiz's conditioning that, you know, <laughs> all the, the videos of his quads, which is, you know, a little silly in hindsight, but uh, with the Reynoso camp, the Reynoso camp has been so, so hot. And, you know, I mean, Lex touched on this earlier, but I mean, I think a lot of people thought this could just be the worst case scenario version of Chris Ariola. You know, he's now 40. He's been pretty inactive. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, there's some, you know, the the example I was thinking of was like uh, Bermain Stavern Wilder rematch where Stavern just came in, didn't even train and Wilder just knocked him out in one round, showed him no respect. I mean, I think a lot of people, especially when they're reacting to this being on pay-per-view, thought that that's what the fight could be. And so I think, you know, the scorecards themselves, fine. I, I get where people have reactions and they're sort of factoring in things separate from scoring like expectations. Lex, is there anything you wanted to finish? I don't know if your mic is Can back. you hear me, first of all? Yeah. Okay, that was uh, weird. But no, Tom, Tom touched on everything. Okay. Okay. I, I think the only thing I would, I would add here is that what we have in this situation, and as Tom said... This isn't uncommon, but to me, this is just an example of people looking for something to complain about. And you see this, it's, this is not exclusive to boxing. This is a, a, a human being sort of phenomenon where if you load up Twitter at any given time about when you're watching a program or a show or whatever, there's always something people are complaining about. And it becomes like the, the sort of the way you fit in is by having something bad to say about something. And so this is an example of like, you got to have something to complain about right now. And like, let's be real. Like, is anybody legitimately questioning the result? No, we all know Andy Ruiz won that fight. And if your complaint is that, well, um, the scorecards didn't tell the story and maybe Ariola should have gotten a, a, a round two or three more. It's like, okay, but. I mean, okay, fine. It would be good for Chris Ariola's self-esteem, sure. But what is there any major harm being done here? I don't think so. And if anything, we've shown that these kind of things can help because it endears the person who, quote unquote, is the victim going forward. I mean, George right. Groves got a fight, got a I mean, he had so many good high-paying fights based off of what many People believe, perceive to be an injustice when he was stopped a little too soon, according to some, in that fight with Carl Frotch. But it turned out that that was the right move. I think if George Gross could go back and if they told him, like, look, you're not going to win this fight, how do you want it to play out? He'd say, well, probably just the same thing because it's been good for me. So, you know, just more fake outrage that we'll all forget about. <laughs> I think we've all forgot about it already. Uh, Felix Verdejo has made sure of that but we will get to that in just a bit. Anyway. <laughs> will we? Yeah, but that's a good segue into the next bit here. I mean, about yeah. the, you know, Areola. Overall, the, the, I think overall, that this was a pay-per-view fight. And there was certainly a lot of criticism, complaint, whining, maybe some of that fake outrage, I don't know. But uh, around this fight, around the, the fact that it was on pay-per-view, around the main event, whatever, okay? But the promise of it, the promise, the whole premise of the fight, and really the card, the theme of it, but certainly for the fight, was fireworks. This is Andy Ruiz in a get-back fight after he weighed uh, 600 pounds against Anthony Joshua, because every time they say it, he, he gets a little fatter every time we talk about that fight. Uh, but what, what does he look like? And, and the promise was like, well, this is going to be a great fight. So the question is, did the main event deliver, Tom? I think it definitely did. And, you know, it's, uh, 
I was saying before, relative to expectations. I mean, you know, there was a version of this of Areola comes in. He's in the condition of, you know, to be blunt, Ruiz from the second Joshua fight. You know, comes in 40 pounds overweight, gets bonked on the head, calls it a night. You know, it just ends up being like a retirement paycheck. And, you know, we got the complete opposite of that. I mean, this is a fight which had been in the works for a year Ruiz has been working with Joe Goosen. I think that he's at a stage in his career where having a little bit of time off was beneficial in terms of letting his body recover. So um, I, I think all of those things combined, you had really the best version of Areola we could have expected. Chris, like we've said, uh, excuse me, uh, Andy was caught in this moment of being a little bit of a work in progress. And you ended up getting an extremely competitive fight. Like I said, even if it didn't show up that way on the scorecards, each round felt competitive. You had the drama from the knockdown, you know, that cast a drama over the rest of the fight of, you know, um, you had this element of suspense was like, oh, you know, did losing this weight take something out of Ruiz? Did he take too much damage in the Joshua fights? You know, is Ariola going to be able to finish him off? And, um, you know, I think when you look back, it might not be as entertaining to rewatch um, because it did end up being pretty dominant from a, a scoring standpoint after the knockdown, but definitely during the fight, absolutely delivered for me, I'd say. What about you, Lex? You are a different person. You are not Tom. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't want to like overthink this. You know, at the end of the day, I spent $50 and I had a really fun time. You know, I, there was a, a point in the fight that I thought Andy would get stopped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, you I must feel be like... one of those guys that thinks like when the wrestler pins him after like a DDT, you think like, oh, it's about to be three. <laughs> when it's like that has not been three since 1994. Like, what are you thinking? How are you so believe you didn't that... think that in the third round, one clean shot could have sent Andy to to hell? Hell no. Okay. No, I definitely did. I'll I'll give you know, and I, I was speaking to that before, but again, how many like. Just how many times have we seen this specifically with the topic of weight loss, where fighters, you know, drop down a weight class or you have a heavyweight who comes in like 20 pounds lighter than normal and then just can't take a shot anymore? You know, it's like we talk about the jam jar. I mean, Ruiz took a lot of punishment in the Joshua fight. I mean, I definitely watching this fight was thinking, you know, early on specifically, like, you know, what what's happening here? I mean, that's that was the entertainment during the fight. Like I said, in hindsight, maybe you wouldn't feel that rewatching it knowing how it played out for the, you know, the like, you know, eight or nine rounds after that. But um, no, I mean, that added a lot of intrigue to, you know, the action as it unfolded. And I, I just wouldn't want to say quickly, it's okay to just have fun in boxing. I don't think everything has to be like undisputed or like this KO streak or un, uh, defense streak. You know, sometimes it's cool to just have a fight that's, that that's fun and decent as long as it's not oversold. I never felt that PBC was trying to sell me at this being some like I don't know something that it wasn't. Just just anything that it wasn't, and it made it easy for me to enjoy it. Well, I, I never thought there was going to be a stoppage. Just to go back to that point, I never thought that like I didn't think so. And the reason for that is really simple: is like we're dealing with two warriors here. The stoppage for me was never part of the equation. I did not pick stoppage. I did not have this as, as the way I thought it was going down. The way I thought this was going to go down was Andy Ruiz was going to win a decision. I mean, Ru Ruiz don't got that kind of power. Like, I know he stopped Joshua, but like he did not sleep Joshua. He caught Joshua off the top of the head, threw off his, his, equilibri uh, huh. he threw off his equilibrium, and then just took advantage of that. But that was a, a really more about punch placement than it really was that Andy Ruiz is out here sending dudes to hell. That's just not what it is. And uh, I figured that he was going to get up and start trading. And I just didn't see that playing out here. And so was I right? Well, I was right in, in thinking that. But like in the moment, did, was I right about to have that thought? No. There was... <laughs> I would not sit here and say like, yeah, I'm so smart. It's like, no, I just, that's just how I felt. But I, if you don't feel that way, like I definitely see your point of view. I mean, it did, it Ruiz didn't look good in that exchange. You know, when that happened, he looked real vulnerable, but in terms His of legs like, look crazy. 
Yeah, and Tom may be onto something when he talks about the the weight loss. But I actually think when I saw him, I was like, he didn't lose that much weight. I mean, he looks better than he did in Saudi Arabia. But like, he looked like King Kong Bundy in the fight in Saudi Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I don't see how it like it was going to be hard for him to look that bad again. And I don't think we'll ever see him look that bad in the ring. So I think if you take away that second round, this main event would not have delivered. If the fight had played out the way it did after round three, I would say that that was actually not as good of a main event as we thought we were going to get. Like the fight overall, that just didn't deliver. But it was so good to get that second round because it added crazy tension to the fight. Like there was crazy tension already because like you have two guys who you know want to want to mix it up and then Ruiz is just so fast with his combinations for a heavyweight and then that second round just shows like oh you got to be on edge here because Andy may not be Andy and it it really added to the fight and it like at all points in the fight I think maybe until about the seventh or eighth round is when you realize like okay I think Ruiz is comfortably in in control now but until that point there there was like wilder-esque tension in that fight where you just didn't know if Andy Ruiz was going to be able to keep walking through these shots that he was getting tagged with. Uh, so yeah, I, I think the main event did deliver. Um, also, I'd like did. to say real, I'm sorry to cut you off real quick. It felt good to have the crowd back, man. I didn't see that in the notes and I just want to like throw that out there. Like Andy, like they were doing the Andy chance. There were fights. They were ooh and on and it wasn't fake like that. That felt real good. Um, Rollins last night. So if you didn't, if you have access to our Patreon, we did a post fight, you know, real quick. Well, actually, it wasn't really quick, but it was about an hour. We talked last night, just kind of like initial thoughts and stuff like that. We didn't really practice any takes. We didn't write anything down. We just we just talked. And um, he compared the the crowd kind of like to the tank crowd. And I actually didn't don't agree with that. I don't think we've seen a crowd like this since boxing has come back. And I'll tell you why. When you have a fight in like these bigger venues where there's, you know, people are socially distant and blah, 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 the, the it's just, it doesn't sound right. You know, just does not sound right. And last night, the StubHub Center, now called Dignity Health Sports Park, like this is a just such a great venue for boxing, first of all. It's small, it's intimate, the acoustics are fantastic there. And there are two things we got to give credit to. Like, one, the LA fans, like, you know, to, to, to speak on behalf of my people, because I live in LA, if you guys have never, you know, if it's your first time listening to this podcast, we are out here like really loving boxing. And the other thing is like people have been cooped up in LA for a while and not everybody's had the opportunity to go out to a Dodge game, which is quite expensive, go out to a Laker game, which is quite expensive. We've only had fans back for what, about two weeks now. And so this was the first time that a lot of people with these, you know, the tickets weren't very expensive to get into the, to the venue last night, or at least if you bought them when they first went on sale, that resale market was crazy. The floor seats that were going for, uh, what's 4,000 divided by 250. 16 times what they what the face value was that's uh some of the tickets we're going for um but it was just crazy like it, it was really like the bottle like we took the the cap off the bottle and then the foam just started going everywhere that's what we had last night i was real happy to see that and i don't think tank's fight had that i don't think spence's fight had that i don't think canelo's fight has had that thus far uh but this one just had like that rabid hardcore feel to it that you don't always get, even in the big fights either. Like pre-COVID, you don't usually, you don't often get that. Uh, anyway, so I, I'm totally with you. It was really nice to have a crowd, although we are doing really well with COVID here in California, specifically in LA County. But like you could just, it, you got the feel last night from that crowd also that like we ain't like, this is a, we've, we're past COVID sort of crowd, which makes me slightly nervous. Uh, and I will be yeah, I at the StubHub Center in two weeks. Oh, very cool. Now, I was just going to say, I hadn't, um, I hadn't realized before last night that this was the first fight back in California. It's oh, sort yeah. of crazy how that works. Like, I, you know, I was at the very last show in New York. Like, if you look at the state of New York on BoxRec, it's like the Adam Kanahi gets stomped out. <laughs> uh, 
yes. The Kanaki uh, Hellenius fight. And then it just stops, you know. And the first one back, which was not in front of a real crowd, you know, it was whatever, it was the West Point stuff in um, New York. But that was literally the, the next event. And I guess the PBC has been doing like the Microsoft theater stuff or whatever for their studio shows. But I, I hadn't realized it was actually the first one back period with a crowd. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not bad. 4,000. I mean, it, you know, puts it in perspective that like the Taylor Ramirez, I think they're limited to like 1,500, you know? So, I mean, this is still, I mean, outside of like Texas, um, you know, still a lot of restrictions. And uh, it was pretty cool to get uh, that crowd. You know, it's an outdoor venue, reasonably responsible compared to doing some kind of indoor venue, you know? And yeah, it was great. Um, yeah. And it only seats 9,000. So, well, I mean, I don't think that counts. Maybe it counts at the floor. I don't know. But um, so the restriction on like people and capacity, we're like up there. I think by July, we'll be at 100% capacity here in California. But I am not a scientist or anything like that. So I don't really know. Anyway, what do you guys want to see next for Andy Ruiz? What do you think, Lex? King Kong. Has, um, what, what did I tell? Wait, wait. What did I tell you privately months and months ago? Tell the people. Um, you were saying something about Tank and comparing it to uh, Shakur Stevenson. Is that what, what? you're talking about? No. <laughs> you know, you don't need to quiz Angelo. Just what's your what's your jack here? <laughs> King Kong, man. I want. I've wanted the King Kong fight for months and months and months. I'm flying to LA if it happens. I'm not sure if everyone is excited about that fight as I am, but I love it. King Kong got a lot of love in LA the last time he fought in Staples. I think Andy is ready for Staples. Um, I'd actually like to get your guys' thoughts on that, but maybe when it's you know more time appropriate. But yeah, that's the fight I'd like to see next. What about you, Tom? Or do you want to respond to that if you agree? Oh, I think... Uh... Uh, Luis Ortiz fight feels like a no-brainer, but I mean, to the topic of that uh, you mentioned off the start, is he ready for a title shot? I mean, um, the the Luis Ortiz fight seems like a very natural one. Um, I think it, it was interesting. I was surprised at the amount of fan sentiment I saw that said um, Ortiz would be too risky for Ruiz at this stage; that he should take more time to you know get used to the Reynoso you know system and that camp and figure out his weight and um, I just, to me, that seems, that feels like exactly the right level of threat. Um, You know, this is boxing. It's a competitive sport. You want to have the risk. You want to have, you know, the sense that you don't know what the outcome is. And, you know, let's be honest. If uh, Andy Ruiz can't get by Luis Ortiz, he probably shouldn't get a title shot at one of the heavyweights. Or, you know, he's got to go back to work. I mean, I I think it's a great sort of, you know, effectively an eliminator. and uh, I just love to see it. It just seems like a really exciting fight where um, Lu- Luis Ortiz's strengths could play to Ruiz's weaknesses. You know, it just could be uh, it could be a very interesting fight. There's a really good point you make there that if he can't get past Luis Ortiz, he ain't, he don't belong in a title shot situation. I think I, th- I think that's really fair to say. Um, Ortiz is that guy who, while I would say he's far better than a gatekeeper. Uh, you know, typically we'd associate like a gatekeeper with like somebody like at, at this point, like a Dominic Brazil or something. But um, I, I think it's a risky enough fight that it is actually a very sellable fight. It's doable. It's makeable. Um, the only reason why you don't do it, I think, is because you don't think Andy Ruiz is a sure bet to get past him. Now, that's not to say that that's going to be their thinking, because I think PBC has shown with their matchmaking that uh, they can be a little reckless at times uh, in terms of getting their guys beat uh, and trying to get the natural result that you would think that they'd want to have. Uh, Shout out Vito Melnecki. So, but I think it's a risky fight. I wouldn't mind if these guys fought one another. Uh, And to me, I actually don't want to see that Wilder fight because uh, if Wilder's not going to fight Fury again, I think I'd rather see that guy in a tune-up. I think let's, let's just make sure we still got Deontay Wilder here. Let's make sure that Deontay Wilder is 
not morphed into a guy who's scared to pull the trigger. And we have seen that so many times with guys who can punch. I mean, you guys, I don't know if you guys were fans of Randall Bailey. And if you don't know who Randall Bailey is, you know, this was a guy that was one of the biggest punchers at welterweight you'll ever see. But at some point, at some point, Randall Bailey just couldn't pull the trigger. And you sit there thinking like, man, what? Th- why didn't this guy just let his hands go? He just couldn't do it. And so I want to make sure that Wilder's right. And you know, then the other side of it is like, yeah, but if he isn't, like you just wasted a golden opportunity. So might as well strike while the iron's hot. Fair enough. I can see that point. Uh, if you want to make that point, cool. I think that's a great point to make. And I don't have a response to that. But I, I, I'm all in on the Luis Ortiz thing. There are other heavyweights that would be interesting fights, but I think this is the natural one to make, especially because Luis Ortiz is, you know, who was he last in the ring with that people are going to remember? Deontay Wilder. Well, if Andy beats him, he's got to win over Luis Ortiz, who's a guy that damn near beat Deontay Wilder, and Anthony Joshua. That puts Ruiz in a really good position. Uh, other fights that could be out there for him is like Otto Valin. I mean, wouldn't that be a great fight? We've seen Valin uh, get into some good fights. He had that great fight with Tyson Fury. Uh, he absolutely just destroyed Dominic Brazil, although he didn't stop him. And the other thing about that is Valin don't got the power, at, at least that we see at heavyweight, to like be out here smoking guys. How is he going to do against Andy Ruiz if he, if he don't have the power to hurt him? That, to me, is pretty fascinating. I think on name, it's probably not a fight that people are going to like gush over like they would for Luis Ortiz. Um, everybody wants them heavyweights to be big hitters, but like that don't really describe Ruiz and Balin. Um, any other names maybe you guys want to toss out? Um, I have more names, but I'll get into them once we uh, spin down to Chris Ariola. Okay. All right. Well then, you know, Chris Ariola, does he deserve another prominent fight? And I think prominent doesn't mean like another pay-per-view. So if you think that, please like get your head checked. He mean like, does he deserve to get the spotlight again? Like, sh- can he be in a headliner on a card headline, a, a Fox card, FS one showtime, uh, where are we yeah, at me- with, with Chris Ariola's future? So yeah, Tom, go ahead. Let- yeah, let me roll right into this if you don't mind, Lex. Um, yeah, I mean, I just the thing I want to get into, just throwing out the other names, it's like, you talk about Chris Ariola, just look at what the landscape is at the PBC. They have, you know, Coffee, Frank Sanchez, uh, you, you have the possibility of a Kanaki rematch, and, you know, Ariola also could potentially fight Luis Ortiz. I mean, he's just he's in, in such an interesting position because Chris Ariola is a guy who had fought absolutely everyone you know just thinking of some of these patreon episodes you've been doing reflecting back on boxing from the last 15 years and you know he had oh, fought everyone but this that was re- episode is so good so good <laughs> i'm looking forward to it yeah we can maybe pump it at the end uh you know um uh promote it at the end of the the episode here but um yeah i i mean there luis i mean uh chris Ariola. as i said he could have come in out of shape he could have just you know just cashed out this is rejuvenated Chris Ariola, and you know that seems like a cliche, but you know again, he's reached a point in his career where a little bit of an, an activity uh, probably helped him. He has a great thing going with Joe Goose, and I think there's no question that the game plan that they had coming in was able to produce that knockdown in the second round. You know, they they ultimately weren't able to sustain that success for the whole fight, but you know they had a great game plan coming in. Ariola, Ariola was in great shape. And I think sometimes it's, you know, I mean, this was the point I wanted to make before um, about what to do with Ruiz. Like the thing I hated back in the day with HBO was it was so transparent. You know, they had like at any given time about five A sides that they were developing, that they were trying to develop to pay-per-view level talent. And then they would bring in opponents who, you know, they'd maybe give like one fight just to kind of get a little bit of exposure. And then that would just be someone who was supposed to be fed to one of the A sides. And it was just like such a transparent narrative, you know, it's like, and and what I love about, you know, this, you know, the sort of modern landscape of boxing where you have, you know, the PBC started this and this is expanded with top rank. And you see this in England as well, definitely is like more of just these ecosystems. It doesn't all need to be about building to one pay-per-view. 
Um, you know, I think Chris Ariel is a guy, like I said, he had fought everyone from the last generation. And now you have all these fresh fights. Like it doesn't need to be about coffee fighting Ariola and coffee beating Ariola so coffee can fight Wilder or Ruiz. Like maybe Ariola would win that fight and that's not the end of the world. You know, I feel like that could be an entertaining fight and that's, you know, uh, it's its own, you know, positive thing like that, that produces its own value. Again, talking as well about the Frank Sanchez fight. I mean, all these fights, I, I mean, it's funny because it just used to be, I mean, Chris Ariel used to be the guy who had fought absolutely everyone. And now it just feels like <laughs> he has a, a wealth of options. Um, Lex or Angelo? Um, <clears throat> I think 100% the answer is yes, that he does deserve another prominent fight. And like the thing to really understand here is what does he bring to the table? Because at the end of the day, like there are tons of fighters across any division. This is not restricted to any one promoter or network. When you size up guys to fight on TV, you got to look at what they bring to the table. What does Chris Ariola bring to the table? Well, look, let's take a guy like Dominic Brazil. What does he bring to the table? I'm going to open this up to the floor. Guys, what does he bring to the table? There's only one <laughs> thing. So if you don't say there's one thing, I'm going to slap the hell out of you. I assume you mean power, but no, nope. um, he don't even bring that. He is a I'm big guy. Opponents. What's that? I said common opponents. Uh, you're getting warmer. What he brings to the table is he's got a name. People at least recognize the name Dominic Brazil. You probably recognize his name for the wrong reason. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's the guy that Deontay Wilder sent into another realm. Yeah, that's the guy. Uh, but he don't offer anything else at this point. You know, I think it's time. I, I respect Dominic Brazil and all this stuff, but like we look at what we saw last time out. It's like, yeah, that's probably the end of the line for him. He's got a name, and sure, uh, he'd be the best name on Jared Anderson's resume, but we don't really want to see that. Okay. There's no, there, it doesn't do anything. And like the cynical sort of matchmaking that we see across everybody, you know, doing it is like, yeah, get that old guy you know, get him back in the ring. So we ask somebody on his resume and it can get kind of sad sometimes uh, where you see some of these guys who got DeMarcus Corley on their resume. And it's like, yo, Corley's like 152 fights deep, you know? Uh, but if you look at what Chris Ariola brings to the table, he brings a name first and foremost. And that's like, that already is, gets you in the door, but we don't stop there. Because he still brings a pressure style. He still brings some power. He still brings a guy who's a professional who can game plan. And I got to speak on this. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about this last night with, with Rollins. But he brought in a game plan and executed it pretty well. And for the first six rounds of that fight, you saw Andy Ruiz not comfortable because of a uh, of a game plan that Ariola was executing that was a drastic departure from what you saw in the Konaki fight which shows that we still got a fighter that's in there not operating purely on instinct and so hell yes Ariola deserves another prominent fight and you don't need to throw him in there with you know he don't need to fight Luis Ortiz he don't need to fight any like like you know top guy at heavyweight but if you saw that, you wouldn't be mad at like Otto Valin fighting Ariola because he don't got any other options, you know, title wise. You wouldn't mind seeing Ariola in there with a Michael Coffey. Shoot, I wouldn't mind seeing him in there with Darmani Rock and say like, look, one of you guys is done. Figure it out. Okay. Wouldn't mind seeing that. So um, I definitely, and, and the crazy thing is, I didn't think I was going to be saying this after the fight. So I got to give a shout out to Chris Ariola for the guy who came up at, and, and was there to win and worked his ass off. And like, it really worked. Lex, I don't know if you answered this. I think you did. No, I mean, it's, I agree with both of you guys. It's just, who's the guy, you know, is it, uh, is it Sanchez? Is it Charles Martin? Is it Otto Wallen? Is it Chris Kofi? Ariola will beat Frank Sanchez. I mean, I, I have no, I don't really have a take on how that fight plays out, but there's a lot of there's a lot of those mid tier guys at PBC. I, I wouldn't mind seeing. Don't the fight. think Frank Sanchez is good. It, is it uh, Gerald Washington? 
I mean, you guys can pick who it is. Whoa, but, whoa, yeah. whoa. Okay. There's another name where it's like he brings his name. That's literally all he brings. Gerald, the, the remains of Gerald Washington should probably stay uh on 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 the burner at this point now. We should probably leave Gerald Washington out unless he's gonna be in there with a guy who's at a similar level than him and they ain't really doing too much damage. But Chris Ariola and Gerald Washington, yikes. No thanks. Ariola will look like <laughs> Deontay Wilder. <laughs> I'm another another football player to the resume, right? <laughs> we we saw what Ariola did to the last football player he fought in Seth Mitchell. It won pretty. If you guys don't remember, some of you may not even know who Seth Mitchell is. That's the crazy thing. Like if you started watching boxing in 2017 or so, you know Mayweather McGregor brought you in, and if that's the case, you know welcome. You don't even know who Seth Mitchell is, and that is somebody that you can find out all about on our Patreon. What we did a pretty deep dive on the whole Seth Mitchell experiment and just how that was so great until it went absolutely south. Uh, all right, let's talk about the undercard. We'll get back to, we'll have a, a, a conversation about the <laughs> I'll card I'll just on the touch whole. on that for a second, but I just, I, I, I had enjoyed rewatching some of my old um, Chris Ariola clips and posted a bunch of his sound bites on Twitter and, and actually got like my most activity on Twitter this week was not like highlight clips of fighting. It was Chris Ariola post fight clips and uh, Seth, Seth Mitchell one very memorable. Um, <laughs> all right. We'll come back to talk generally about the card in just a little bit, but let's talk about the undercard. Abel Ramos, Got back in the win column against Omar Figueroa. Simple question for you guys. Um, now, granted, I, I do want to preface this by like, Omar Figueroa clearly had something going on at the end of that fight. There was a lot of blood coming from his mouth. I don't know what the cause of it was. I don't know if you guys were able to pick up on what exactly was going on there. But um, while being respectful to Omar Figueroa and potentially something actually being wrong with him, I hope that's not the case, but can you guys make sense of what it was that Omar Figueroa was trying to accomplish in the ring last night? Lex? <laughs> yeah. To Tom's honest, like, you I... take this one, Lex. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I don't have uh, much of a clue. I saw people putting the, a bunch of uh, Jim Carrey gifts. Um, that was good. That was, Sean Porter put that, and I was like, Sean. Yeah, that was that was on point. A little uh, what was the guy's name? Emmanuel Burton, drunken master. I said that. I yeah, I thought I was. I thought of that too. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what he was doing. It was uh, it it was strange looking, but uh, you know, I don't know. And and by the way, he did post on social media, and I, I guess he said that he's fine. You know, he said that he'll be back, and it was a tough fight, but he, everything is okay with him health wise. So, yeah, that, the end was ugly, but. Uh, I don't know. I'll bounce it back to Tom because I don't have an answer, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd rather talk about Abel Ramos than Omar Figueroa. But no, nope, uh, I mean, we gotta talk about Omar. We gotta talk about what he was. We'll talk about Abel in the next question. What was he doing? I mean, I don't. I'm I'm gonna be the buzzkill here, but no, I mean, no, 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 me, no. Uh, then don't then don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just save it for okay. the next question. Yeah. Because uh, I I I just I was looking at. What he would chose to do, the style that like, and granted, this is how he fights, right? He's fought like this, but like, I don't know what he was doing last night. Like that style just didn't work. And I think was it um, Lennox Lewis? I think said this on commentary, and it was a like probably the most um, insightful thing Lennox has said in probably five years of being on commentary. He said that. I don't know what he's doing because when you defend that way, you can't punch. So you're just going to get hit. And that's what he was doing. And I was like, oh, my God, what is Figueroa doing here? Uh, but I, I don't know. It was just so mind boggling what it, that that Joel Diaz was like after a couple of weeks at camp was like, yeah, this is going to work. Let's take this fight. That is wild to me. Anyway. Where did things go wrong for Omar? Was this a matter of Abel Ramos being better than anybody anticipated? Is Abel Ramos getting better? Is he improving as a fighter? Uh, you guys can pick and choose what it is that you want to answer. So, Tom, you wanted to get something in on Abel Ramos, so go for it. 
Yeah, I just think all the respect to, to Abel Ramos. I mean, you know, I guess Figueroa came in as the A side and, you know, he fought like a maniac. So <laughs> I guess that's why. You and would not start with the him, maniac but... that we normally say in the ring. Usually a maniac's like, no, nah, they just came forward and threw 94 punches around. It's like, nah, this was a maniac. Like he didn't know what he was doing. Yeah, but I mean, it's like Abel Ramos is a guy like, you know, he had a real amateur background. He's not just like, you know, people sometimes stereotype and just be like, oh, you know, he's just some random guy from Mexico or something. But, you know, he had a real amateur background. He fought, you know, just to, to rattle this off, he's fought Maurice Hooker, Levon, uh, the Wolf, Gavama Chama. I, I didn't quite say that correctly. Uh, Regis Progre, uh, Ivan Branchik, Jamal James. Um, uh, Francisco Santana, uh, Ryan Perella in that, you know, weird stoppage <laughs> situation. And then just prior to this had a, a split decision loss to your Dennis Ugas, you know, Ugas is probably fighting Spence next. So, um, I, Ramos is just a guy to me. I mean, he's really established. He's, he's, he's not, you know, he's not in the top three. He's not in the top five at 147, but you know, I, I think he's reached the point where people finally realize he's deserving of respect and he's a pretty dangerous guy. You know, um, the the thing I think about with him is like, you know, think of like the hard fight that Keith Thurman had with Jose Zito Lopez. That was like, you know, harder than expected. I mean, I, I feel like we're sort of at the point where um, I would like to see Ramos get like a big fight. I mean, I think if he fought Sean Porter, I think that's actually like, an interesting competitive fight. I mean, Porter would be the favorite, but I'd like to see what happens in that fight. Same thing with Danny Garcia and Keith Thurman. I mean, we we're sort of talking about um, Keith Thurman, uh, excuse me, Andy Ruiz against Luis Ortiz. And it's kind of like, well, if he can't beat Luis Ortiz, does he even deserve a, a title shot? You know, and I, I feel like Ramos is that type of guy where you have these names at 147 who have started to become a little bit inactive. They're increasingly just losing to Spence, I guess. They're they're at that point in their career. And um, Ramos is just another guy there again. Like like the, the reputation Ugas had like, you know, a year or two ago when people were just kind of starting to realize he was that kind of guy. Um, again, Jose Cito Lopez, I feel like he's built that reputation now. And um yeah, I mean, I just, I think, I think, I think uh, we should get, you know, some other bigger fights with Ramos. And I think the positioning here was meant to set him up for that. I mean, he came in as the favorite. Uh, Figaro was still the bigger name. You know, it's ironic because it's kind of like the the path <laughs> Ugas had. You know, he gets to beat uh, Figueroa, and that's setting the stage for a Spence fight. Ramos gets to beat Figueroa, and uh, I, I hope and I feel like it will be the case that he's going to get a, a pretty substantial fight off of this. I don't agree with that at all. Um, we've seen him step up, and we know what we get when Abel Ramos steps up. He's come up short four times on that big stage. And I don't, I'm not opposed totally to the idea, but I am opposed to coming to that conclusion after beating the Omar Figueroa that showed up last night. Here, I'm going to phrase it this way. Would you make a $10,000 bet that Keith Thurman beats him? Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's the question. Uh, if uh, if anybody that Regis Prograde beat, so can Keith Thurman. Like, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about Keith Thurman here. We're talking about one time. We're talking about one of the best welterweights in the world until this guy started to get injured and married. You know, the downfall of all great men. So well, he's still injured and he's still <laughs> married. So uh so, so as are you, but uh, you know, I don't want to air out all of your personal information. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about though for at least the thing that interested me is like what where did things go wrong for Omar Figueroa? Because it's such a crazy story if you think about it. like Omar Figueroa was on a rampage at 135 and like the guarantee with Omar was that you were going to get a fight of the year contender when he stepped into that ring. And we know where, what happened. I think somebody wrote like a really stupid article where they're like, yeah, he was like just cool. And then he disappeared for two years and then he came back and it's like, yeah, what it's like, what happened? It's like, uh, did you not see the news about the, him having the DUI and missing out on the Broner fight? 
And then Br- Broner went and one upped him. Like, you know, Omar's got some demons, as they say in the world of wrestling. And he had to fight those. And I'm super proud of the fact that he was able to get a victory. He's able to come in in shape, made the weight fine. He actually had some visible abs, which we haven't seen from him since what, like 2016, maybe even earlier. We haven't seen abs on him since what, like 2013, maybe. And so Omar worked his ass off to get into shape for this fight. And if you listen to the interviews, like he's very much cognizant of where things have gone off the rails for him and kind of like the opportunity that he's squandered in his career. Like there's, you know, mad respect for him. But at the same time, things went wrong when you got a guy in Omar Figueroa who was at 135 and he wasn't a big puncher at all. This is a guy that got by on volume. You could say that Omar Figueroa was kind of like a lightweight Leo Santa Cruz without a lot of the skill that Leo has. And you now have that guy at 147, a guy who just doesn't have the physical strength to compete with Abel. And like, that's one of the things I will praise Abel on is like, he's a strong physical fighter that knows how to use it. And he just bullied Omar around that ring. Like Omar just had no shot in that ring last night. But to to summarize, you know, I'm I'm I, I am impressed with what I'm seeing from Abel Ramos. Okay. But so far, I he hasn't erased the stigma to me that he's a guy that can keep pace with guys but can't win the race, if that makes any sense, Tom. Because we've seen him come up short in these fights. I want to see this guy win a fight. You know, that would be great. But um, I, I think there's a lot of things working against him, including, like, the clock, you know, as he's getting older as a fighter. Although he's only, like, 29, I think. Anyway. Um, Lex, well, I mean, he had one. No, just say you want to see him win a fight. He had won like 10 fights in a row before he lost a split decision to Ugas. And uh, yeah, I know the Perella ending is controversial, but I mean, give him credit for getting two heavy knockdowns in the 10th round of that he, fight. I mean, most he was of trying to win every were, round. W- most of those fights would have been covered by Tim Boxeo. <laughs> yeah, literally so, uh, Cheers Bar, by the way. So, you know, you know Tim Boxeo podcast dropped but. by Francisco Santana. You know, I, I I need to see a little bit more, and like Omar Figueroa is just not the guy. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Lex, yeah, I, I feel like you haven't gotten to talk about it for a while, for a while. No, I mean, I'm just, I, I guess I'm just thinking who could be next for him, and that's like the only thing I have on my mind, really. According to Tom Keith Thurman, I mean, is that the level you'd like to see him on, like a Keith Thurman, a Sean Porter, Danny Garcia? No, Would that... no, I want to see him fight Stan Yonis. That, that's the name I saw floated on Twitter after the fight. Um, I'd be perfectly okay with that fight. It's a Tom good, good crossroads fight. Saying Keith, but... Yeah, I think that was the uh, the guy Boogs. I don't know. The, someone was speculating on that based on like WBA rankings. I mean, it, it can be, a, you know, that can be a little bit hard to parse, but... Well, um, one of the other giveaways is anytime you have two fights in the same division on the card there's a good shot that those guys are going to wind up fighting each other. And I think the expectation, and like, if you think about it, it it's actually brilliant. Omar Figueroa beats Abel. So now the young nephew of Abel has to come to the rescue, make it a family affair. (laughs) Jesus to defend the honor of his uncle who was beaten by Omar Figueroa and Jesus destroys Omar. I think that was one way that this could have played out that would have been I think great in in Fox's eyes, but that didn't quite happen. Yeah, I see it a little bit differently. Look, I'll just make my case, and we don't have to agree. But I mean, look, Sean Porter is going to need an opponent. Keith Thurman definitely needs an opponent. Danny Garcia is going to need an opponent at some point. You know, he's talked about going up to one fifty four, but we'll see what happens there. Um, I just I think Ramos has done enough. I would like to see him get one of those fights. I just I think it would you know again that's that's the premise i'm going with here is that he uh he's done enough he deserves a, a higher profile fight in the way that uh ugas has and i think uh Josito lopez has as well um look if he ends up fighting stanny onus great i mean i'll totally watch that fight uh if he fights boots great i'll watch that fight too but um i think know, i just think you have those guys need opponents 
And I feel like he's reached a point where I think that would be not bad. I definitely would like to see what the Keith Thurman, 2021 version of Keith Thurman would do in that fight. I mean, Keith Thurman has basically said he's looking for one fight and then hoping for like the Spence pay-per-view. And I feel like this is, you know, that's the thing. I, I, I don't know. I mean, Angela, you say that and I get where you're coming from about Keith's reputation, but um, I think this is the type of fight I want to see if I want to, I want to fight where there's some intrigue of whether or not Thurman can lose. I don't want him to be in with someone who's more shot, more injured, older, whatever. Uh, I want there to be, uh, you know, I want there to be some intrigue there. And I, I think that's the type of fight he needs to get uh, a pay-per-view. I wouldn't be shocked if he's fighting Abdu Kakarov next. Well, I mean, you know, that kind of fits that criteria to me. I think, I think he, you know, he's undefeated. Uh, again, the point is not that he would win, but I feel like I, I want to fight that's interesting enough that there are people on boxing Twitter who hate Keith Thurman saying that the opponent's going to win. <laughs> that's the energy I want. Um, all right, let's move on to our next fight. Sebastian Fundora got what I think was an ill-timed stoppage against Jorge Cota. Now, notice the words I used there. I said ill-timed because my stance is that this wasn't necessarily a bad stoppage. It was just at the wrong time. Like, if he would have stopped it five or ten seconds earlier, I don't think anybody would have complained. And likewise, if you'd waited five or ten seconds, Everyone would have been fine with it. It would have been a perfect job, maybe even a little too late at that point. But ultimately, he just picked the wrong time to stop it. But I think everyone can agree that that fight was going to need to be stopped in like very shortly. Uh, do you guys agree with that? Absolutely. Lex, Lex you wanna <laughs> do you want to elaborate? No, I mean, like, <laughs> like he was. This he, is a podcast. I, I'm not. No, my, you. I'm not I, I just thought it was here, like, okay? no, listen, Coda was one big punch from being stopped. Um, I think the way he fought excited people. You know, he kept tagging Fundora, and it's like he, he looked like he was loading up for one big shot, and maybe he'd land it, maybe he wouldn't. But at the end of the day, it's like you want this guy to get home safely. So I think the stoppage was, was right. It's just, uh, you know, people are bloodthirsty at the end of the day. That's all that was. Coda fought that fight like he was Jamel Charlo. Like, bro, you don't have that kind of power. Relax, okay? You're not going to one-punch Fundora. Especially after, like, the first couple landed. Because like, he did land a lot of those overhand shots. But, like, after the first couple landed, I think he should have realized, like, all right, I get, this, I get what's going on here. This guy, he's going he's, it's gonna take more than a few to put this guy away. Uh, anyway, Tom, do you think, like, uh, how do you think that stoppage affects Fundora? Oh, I think he'll be fine. I mean, I, th I thought it was interesting. I mean, he didn't skip a beat during the post fight. I mean, he basically just gave the speech he had in his head uh, about, you know, basically, I knocked him out. I'm moving on to the next fight. I mean, he, I don't think he even like thank Kodo Koda for giving him a hard fight or, or anything like that. I mean, it was sort of funny. Um, yeah, he'll be fine. I mean, look, uh, he's already at the point. He's not like... <laughs> <laughs> What's her way of saying this? Like, this isn't like Virgil Ortiz or Jerron Ennis, where after their fights, people were like breaking down every single time they got punched in the fight. Um, you know, he's already at the point where it's the question is kind of like, is he just a complete meme fighter or is he a contender? Like, you know, I, I, I don't think he, he's being held to that high of a standard. I definitely didn't like the amount that he got hit, but yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you guys. It was, you know, good stoppage, just bad timing and you know it's like reminiscent of word kovalev too a little bit where like the last punch to land before the stoppage was like a low blow but kovalev at that point had a was hurt and had abandoned the fight so it you know it's a good stoppage but it's kind of an embarrassing timing yeah that's that's well said i think at that point we know that um we knew what was going to happen Kovalev was about to get seriously hurt if they would have allowed it to just keep going on. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, part of me thinks, and, and Rollins said this on the podcast last night, part of me thinks that we Fundura, for like his star, needed that stoppage, and he needed it to matter. He needed to look like a way, like the type of fighter that's like, okay, he's 6'6". Six, six. Or six seven, whatever. And he weighed in at 152. And 
he also demolished Jorge Cota and did it in the package where it is almost impossible to imagine how anybody can have a game plan for him because everybody's going to look like a child when they stand next to him. And he didn't get that. And like, I think it would have did a lot for him if he would have done that. But I also think like Fundora is like such a soldier because he, after the fight, was just like, they asked him like, you know, title shot. He's just like, I don't know, whatever my promoter says. Oh, what, 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 maybe we're like two years away. I don't know. Maybe one It's just like, this guy's like, no, no, no. I'm just a fighter. I show up, I fight. That's it. And it is a, this is a different vibe we get from Fundora than we are typically getting from fighters and, and all that. So let's see. Oh, actually, I just responded to the next question, but I guess I'll open it up to you guys. But like, do you think he made the kind of statement that he needed to make as like a young rising contender? Although, although I said, do you agree with me or not? Yeah, I mean, I think the statement was fine. You know what I mean? Like, he he was about to sleep Coda. You know, the ref stopped it maybe a bit prematurely, but he he did what he needed to do. I think people saw weakness, and we'll we'll continue to wonder about those weaknesses until they're exposed. But in the meantime, he's a lot of fun to watch, and he shows great promise. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I want to see him again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, his thing is not that he's unhittable. I mean, his thing is he's an action fighter and a pressure fighter, and he reaches the point in a fight. You know, look, I totally get what you're saying. From an aesthetic standpoint, it would have been better if uh, he had landed that last punch and Coda had gone down on his face. But it's not like, you know, that's not how boxing works. It's not the ref's job to you know, he's not like producing like a music video or something. Like, you know, that's, that's just that's not really like, the point um it you know yeah that would have been better but so goes boxing but i mean look fundora is a guy i went back and rewatched a bunch of his fights leading up to this and we've talked about how he looked so good against nathaniel gallimore and habib ahmed and you know it was funny going back to the gallimore fight because that was the fight where he he got you know a more convincing stoppage and um he got hit a lot in that fight too. <laughs> and I feel like Pete, that wasn't like the takeaway from that fight. I think the takeaway from the Coda fight is going to be, you know, this is a guy who delivers action whenever he gets in the ring. And again, I, I, I just, I think it's a different pitch. I don't think this is like Ennis or Virgil Ortiz where people are worrying about whether or not he's pound for pound number one. I totally get your thing. And I think you were saying you and Rollins had discussed this. I, I, I did listen to the, um, the reaction pod, but, um, just, just as a note, but um, uh, yeah, that that you definitely you can see the pitch they'd like to have that he's so big and tall, and how could anyone even fight him? But that's that's just again, it's kind of not his style. He's a pressure fighter. He gets hit. He's he's never going to look completely invincible. And kind of to to seg to the next point, it's like what really starts to matter with him is who he's actually beating. I mean, just when it comes down to it, he's beaten enough fringe contender guys at this point. I mean, it's valid to consider him in the top 10 in a contender. And again, it, it, it doesn't look like some of the other prospects that are coming up, but at a certain point, he's actually just racking up wins that are pretty nice. Yeah, and if you keep winning, you know, you will rise the ranks of the sanctioning bodies. I think what's going to be hard for him is getting matchups. Because, like, although he shows weakness, he looks like a really tough fight. And I wonder if you don't have, like, one-punch KO power, like, what, what's the game plan for him, really? Like, outbox him? Like he just marches right. forward and like <laughs> just rains punches on you. So I don't. I'm very. I have a name. I mean, I don't know what you guys would think, but I. I think. Brian oh, well, let's Pirelli, let's parse this point for a second a little bit more wait, because wait, I hold think on. that. Did you say Fundora versus Perella? Yes. What's wrong with you? What do you mean? What's wrong with me? On what end? Perella? I don't. He just had a draw with Tony Harrison. Um. That yeah, seems I, like a natural name. I was gonna. Th I threw that out too on the notes. Ah, uh, I don't like it. I don't like it. I, I Perella either run it back with with Harrison or like let's get him another fight so we could just make sure we got we got a a real one at one fifty four. Also, I think Fundora's a little past that. I mean, he just beat a guy that's shared the ring with Jamel Charlo and Erickson Lubin. 
But like who that's my thing with 154. It's like who's past that but would definitely take that fight? Like I don't see Lubin taking that fight. Do you? Um Lubin's yes, I do, because that dude is about to get in the ring with Jason Rosario, which shows that Lubin ain't scared of nothing. And the that's other true. thing is Lubin will knock Fandora out. <laughs> oh my god. Those shots that Jorge Cota was landing last night, Lubin lands those shots. It's night night. I love Fundora, by the way. Okay. And I'm not trying to hate on him, but like, let's be real here. Uh, there are certain guys that in the division that they, they land certain shots that are going to be good against Fundora. I think Lubin's left that he loops is going to be uh, no good for Sebastian Fundora. Jamel Charlo. Uh, we, <laughs> I think I don't know if you guys heard this. Somebody asked Jamel about Fundora, and he said uh, it would look like the Ann Wolf, uh, that Ann Wolf fight. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and he's absolutely right. I think uh, he would loop a shot that would. It, well, I keep saying looping a shot. That's really the only way most of these guys are going to land a punch on Fundora is they got to throw some looping like overhand shot because he's so big. Uh, but I, I think I want to see him in in fights where it's like we get somebody a little closer to his skill level i don't i don't need to see him ch challenge too much so far i also think because he could be a like a big star just because of the crazy combination that he brings of like being tall and also fighting like he's five four <laughs> i mean my my thing on this is like you know Again, it's like when we judge prospects, we hold them to a higher standard than their opponents. But I mean, like last night, again, he got clipped, but it's like, would you rather be Bandora or Coda? I mean, Coda was just getting absolute shit beaten out of him in Max that fight. Kellerman here. How's your herpes? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that is, that's not. No, no. You don't think it's herpes? What is it then? Kellerman? It's like yeah. well discussed. He has like a scar from uh yeah, that's no, that's mm. like that's part of his whole thing. If you've ever read a profile mm. on Kellerman, I, mm. I don't want to talk about this right now. You um, want to talk about your herpes? <laughs> dear <laughs> Lord. No, but um Lex wants like, I mean, to it's... fight Omar Figueroa next. <laughs> no way. No, but I oh my god, I've been trying to get this point out for five minutes. No, but look, um Fundor is an interesting thing again because it's like we hold prospects to a high standard because you're trying to extrapolate like okay based on this fight how would he perform against a higher level of opponent but i mean again it's like who wants to get in there with him i mean it's not necessarily okay you can say that you can argue why a certain fighter might beat him but even if they beat him it's going to be a tough physical fight um but the the main thing that i think everyone was thinking is just he got hit a little too much i'm you know Right. I mean, even if he's a physical pressure fighter, gets hit sometimes, even by that standard, he got hit too much. And, you know, we've seen how this story ends. I mean, just, you know, we were talking before about Adam Kanaki. He was he previously was like, you know, iron chinned. He'd walk through anything and then he'd he'd, you know, walk guys down. And, uh, you know, then he got knocked out by Robert Hellenius. You know, we saw Andy Ruiz walk through hell with Anthony Joshua and then got knocked down by Chris Ariola. You know, that might end up being a bigger issue or not. We don't really know that, but um I I just I don't want to see Fundora who's 23 getting hit that much. So I, I that's the main thing I'm thinking. I definitely, you know, um to sort of cap off the whole topic of Fundora. If if they said like Fundora versus Tony Harrison or Fundora versus J-Rock, like, I would buy those fights on pay-per-view. I mean, how fucking awesome would those fights be? That wouldn't necessarily be the best thing for his career, though. Like, as a fan of him, I definitely wouldn't mind to see him take maybe two fights at a little bit of a lower level and see see if he can tighten up his game a little bit before he puts the foot on the gas pedal with his career. Let me ask you guys this question, all right? Do I want you to give me a number. 100% confident, 0% confident, okay? You guys clear on the parameters here? Yes. Tom? Yeah. All Dear right. Lord. How, what, what number confidence are you that Fundora beats Jared Hurd? <laughs> I love the question. So Hurd's going know. up to 160, though, so I'm passing on No, that. 154. There's, some, there, there's a lot of back and forth about that, and you're trusting the reporting of somebody who's uh, famously inaccurate. 
Okay. I thought that was pretty well confirmed. Um, um, I would say 100% confident. I don't even confident need to. Confident that Fedora beats Jared Hurd. That's a $10,000 bet. I, that I love Fundora it. beats Jared Hurd. I'm. I love you're 100% it. You're 100 sure. I love it. He's he said ten thousand uh, dollars. Tom about you guys to seen make a Hurd's lot of last fight broke. You know who he's training with right now? What what the what do you think he's going to look like in his next fight? We shall soon see. We will talk about that in, in a little bit. But uh, Lex, you, you got to give your number here. It's Forty. Yeah. Forty percent. That's a, that, see, that's the one thing that, like, this is the fight that I want most for Fundora. And I don't care how you guys feel about what the outcome is. The, the, the thing about the fight that I like is that Jarrett Hurd is the biggest guy at 154. If he goes to 160, fine, you know, whatever. Then it's Tony Harrison. But, like, the biggest guy at 154 is Jarrett Hurd. And not only is he big in terms of height-wise, which also Fundora is big in, in height-wise, He's just like a monster of a guy. Like, how does Fundora do with a guy who can be physical with him? Thus far in his career, we haven't seen anybody be physical with him. Uh, and that's what I really want to see uh, Fundora get pushed with. But, uh, Tom, uh, $10,000, you say? <laughs> 10000 Yeah, again, I, I, I just, I don't have much faith in, like, the K-Karoma. I'm with you. I'm with you. I think K-Karoma. I don't have any faith nothing. in the I think current sucked, version but... of Jared Hurd. But you, you ten thousand that that kind of confidence. I just need to hear you say yes, absolutely. I already said it. All right, you just got you know. Just want to hear it one more time for for the listeners, so they just know that if you got ten k in the bank and you and they make that fight and you're trying to double your money or go broke, I don't know. Tom's your guy. I didn't say one to one. I said uh, based on whatever the odds are. So, but anyway. <laughs> All right, he's edging. Uh, all right, Jesus Ramos opened up the pay per view with a decision win over Javier Molina. Shout out to <laughs> all the Javier Molina fans that were in the arena last night because it wasn't enough that you watched Javier Molina come up short against Jesus Ramos, but they were out there beating ass in the stands. I don't know if you guys seen the videos, but they were smoking some dudes in the stands. Even the girl kicked somebody in the chest, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, anyway, go back and watch all of that. Yeah, I laughed really hard when you guys mentioned that on the podcast last night, and I'd noticed that as well. I mean, that's like it's not great branding for it's never good when someone has like a giant, like branded shirt that says like Javier Molina on it or, or Team Molina, whatever it said. I don't remember exactly, but you know, I and they're <laughs> visibly involved in a brawl. I disagree. Imagine if Javier Molina just developed the reputation. It's like, look, this is a tough guy, he's gonna be in tough fights. Doesn't matter. But if his fans are in the venue, it is going to be like just all out action at some point in the night. You're going to see a rumble. And if Javier Molina gets that reputation where like you got to have an extra police presence when Javier Molina's on the card, that's a great gimmick. People want to see him fight Keith Thurman. You have to love that he had a crew. You know, Dude, I mean, he's, he's the local. B-side Norwalk is not in that the far. pay-per-view opener. Well, I know. And, you know, he was an Olympian in 2008 or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's like, yeah, people just, they're like, oh, this is just some random B-side. But it's like, no, this is a guy who's been fighting his entire life, has, you know, fans, supporters who are coming to his fight. I mean, anyway. Uh, just so you know, where he's from, Norwalk, is 12 miles away from the venue. So like, every, you know, everyone in town who's who's down with Javier Molina, which I imagine is, you know, at least 30, but probably more than that. Uh, yeah, they were there and they were there to fuck someone up if they were disrespecting. And apparently somebody stepped over the line and they had to get smoked. Lex, you're the type that'll start a fight at a uh, at an event, aren't you? I'm the type that'll record the fight at the arena and i won't shake the camera at all all right so let's say uh me and rollins are scrapping you're not you're not going to jump in you're going to pull out your phone oh no for the gang i'm definitely backing up that's that's a must you have when, to. when 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 j-rock uh is there and he slaps tom or more more likely <laughs> Breadman slaps tom <laughs> are you pulling out your phone or are you gonna cold cock bread man Oh no, me and Breadman have unfinished business. So. 
uh, Tom, that's what you get, you know, if you, you, you talk the way you talk. Anyway. Yeah, the thing in my mind, I'm just imagining, like, if this is, like, West Side, West Side Story and, like, you oh know, you have, God. like, the, the Jets <laughs> and the Sharks, like, who would be, like, the, the rival crew to the Sunday Puncher group? Uh, apparently, we have quite a bit of, uh, what do you call Do we fan? have heat? Yeah. We got Why do you mention people, that, Tom? But not a crew. We don't have a heat. I don't think we have heat with the crew. I think we're, like, probably one of the few that has, like, a big crew. Because of the nature of the podcast, like we're always rotating people in and out. So like we we got more people, I think, than than others. But I don't know. I don't think we have like like villains or not villains, rivals. So like we're that. like we're the version of like the man who knocks. We're the podcast crew who knocks. What the like, f- what? Like what is that? It's a breaking bad reference. Come on. I, I like, don't remember that. What is that? The well, anyway, it, it just means like you don't need to worry about the scary guy coming to knock at your door. Like we're the one who's coming to knock on their door. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm saying, you know, you're talking about we got the big Sunday puncher crew. I'm saying like, all right, we don't well, need to worry about someone rolling up on us. Anyway, this Tom's is got this, the Breaking Bad reference for everyone else. We're Marlo's this hypothetical crew, okay? is getting we are too drawn out. Crew. Let's talk about uh, uh, Jesus Ramos. I'm Marlo. Uh, Lex, no, no, Tom, you're Chris. And Lex is Snoop. Oh, I wanted to Chris. <laughs> <laughs> the disappointment immediately on his voice. <laughs> He's like, oh, I want... Uh, is Rollins Michael? I like that. I like that. Uh, anyway, did Jesus Ramos take the next step as a prospect? Did you see what I, you I just, to see By the way, I just have to say, at least I got away without being called like the Ziggy... I don't know. I'm trying to think who's like the biggest dud on the wire. Uh, well, it depends on what season you're talking about. If we're Marlo's crew, unfortunately, you can't be Ziggy. But if we were the Sabatka crew, yeah, then you're Ziggy. Well, yeah, I was just talking about the whole show, but OK, yeah. If we were the anyway. if we do the whole show, then uh, Lex is Valchek. Valchek. You guys are getting too deep in the wire for me. I watched the wire like 10 years ago. Oh, you, you have you never rewatched it? Oh, my God. You got to get on that. No, I just I watched it once straight through. W- was it when it came out or it was actually that's not exactly right. I watched it boy again, are we uh, off on a tangent? I think I watched the first and second season right before the third season came out. So then I think I watched the third season onward like as the episodes came out. And I've actually never finished the final season because it was just horrible. Uh yeah, yeah. Not not good in the context of uh, today's news, um, but yeah, I think uh, I, I think I've I've settled it that you and Fred are Herc and Carter. Anyway, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, did did Jesus Ramos show you guys what you needed to see last night? Lex, yeah, for sure, man. He looks really, really good. Like really mature performance. I was kind of hoping that he'd get the stoppage, but it's not a bad thing. You know, it's good to get the rounds in and just. Uh, continue to build confidence so yeah i i like i like everything i saw with them uh, i look forward to seeing them again not sure against who but what about angelo you, what do you mean i go i, I go when i want to go <laughs> okay <laughs> um no I, th- I thought it was great i mean on paper molina was uh similar to uh fundora i was saying I was, i've been i rewatched um all of uh, Jesus Ramos's fights. I mean, he has like a pretty easy career to rewatch because basically at a certain point he, he went with the PBC and like you can watch like his last 10 fights. So, um, and most of them are early knockouts. He's, he's had a mix. Um, I think he went uh, six rounds prior to this was his longest fight. Uh, he was fighting um, some like Eastern European Olympian guy. So he's, he's stepped up a little bit. It's not like, um, uh, Berlanga or, or as Timothy Bradley says, Berlanga. Um, but you know, it's not like he's just being fed pure dead bodies, they actually have been like developing as a prospect. Like, he fought that 16 1 Olympian guy, he fought a 14 0 uh fighter, you know, he'd fought a previously undefeated guy. This was still his toughest test, and it was interesting to see what would happen because you see when he's tested how that differs from like Fundora. <laughs> when he's tested and i think it's interesting because i think coming in the biggest thing people said about jesus ramos was that he was a power puncher and i think it's interesting here i'm sort of reminded of uh the keith thurman episode you did uh on the debuts on the patreon feed um you know it was like he the, the whole sales pitch on thurman was that he was a power puncher and it really ended up being like you start to see even in that fight 
the traits that allowed him to be like a world level fighter was like his patience, his movement, uh, that he was able to set up power shots, like clean scoring blows in that fight. He got a knockout in other fights. You know, those are just scoring punches. And and then it was really interesting to see how this fight played out. You know, when he had his toughest test, it was really more about um, the thing that challenged him more was trying to find Molina, who was able to be elusive and survive. Um, he really didn't get hit in the fight. You know, he didn't need to worry about the defensive side of things. And again, thinking of uh, comparing to, to like the Berlanga, you know, Berlanga definitely was like, you know, getting hit flush, was whiffing big shots. And, um, you know, it was interesting. We, we we definitely learned more about Jesus Ramos, and he still just looks like, you know, the sky's the limit for him. I mean, uh, you know, the one question I have, which I don't think was really answered, is what the deal was with his weight, because I thought he was firmly campaigning well, at 147, and this was at 150. So I don't know if this you is... looked at him? My God, the guy's barrel-chested. Well, no, Tom, real quick, I watched the um, post-fight interviews of... You oh, know, you did. Everybody. I haven't watched those. Okay. And I think he said that he got sick during camp, and it made it difficult to cut the weight, and so they just renegotiated. I, you know, I was wondering if that's what it was, if there was sort of a one-off thing, because that could have even happened for Molina, because Molina actually weighed in heavier than he did. So uh, I'll, I'll check that out. Okay, so that's interesting. No, but it makes a big difference, though. You know, if, is he a 147 with that frame, or is he – because by the if he goes up to 154, he's not really big for the weight class anymore. That's – you know – um, but yeah, anyway, um, your thoughts, Angelo? Um, look, he's still really young. We are dealing with a 20 year old who, I mean, if we look at it, like he's only got two, two years really of legitimate seasoning because prior to that, he was on the Tim Boxeo tour of like fighting at these little venues yeah, literally. in Mexico. Yeah, literally cheers bar. And so, you know. This is a pretty fast development for somebody who came in like unheralded uh, in Jesus Ramos. Now, I will say I actually I, I think he needs uh, more opponents on this level because I wasn't terribly impressed with what I saw. I think there's a lot to like. You can see it right there. Uh, but that's all projection. And like I try to balance when I look at prospects, the projection of the prospect versus what am I actually seeing? Because we can get way just off the fucking rails when you start to project and you think your projection is who you actually are looking at. And that's not the case. That's not what reality is. Think of Edgar Berlanga, who is a fighter that I got fooled on because I actually started thinking like, hey, this guy might actually be good. Like, I know you, you're you're giving him guys to knock out in the first round, but like at the end of the day, he's doing what you expect him to do. And there are fighters who they don't do what you expect them to do. And but then you see him like get stretched out over the course of a fight, and you're like, oh, we got a lot of flaws that we got to work on. Not that they can't be fixed. And when you've got like insane power like that, okay, yeah, um, we we're cooking with fire here. We just need to work some things out. And so you have to be cognizant of where your projection of a, of a fighter is like taking over for what you have in front of you. And so I see a lot with Ramos, but like what I see right now is a fighter who is a very good prospect who I'm definitely looking forward to seeing develop. And I definitely think is going to be good. But right now, like, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, yeah, Jesus Ramos needs to fight Jamal James. Jesus Ramos needs to fight Stan Yonis. Like, no, 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 no. Keep him at the Javier Molina level. Because I think I can, if he was sick during training, I can definitely see that. Because he just didn't look like, you know, lightning. He did not look like, um, I, I don't know, that I don't know why I said that. But he just didn't look like uh, he had so much more explosion that we see in prospects. And so if that was the case, he was sick, I get it. But I definitely need to see, a, a, like, this was not the breakout performance. It could have been, but it wasn't. And so I think they need to keep developing until they can get that breakout performance where it becomes hard to not acknowledge that Jesus Ramos is an elite prospect in boxing. Anything else, guys? All right. Well, I know you guys have been waiting for this. You guys listening at home. I know Tom. I know Lex. I know you've been waiting for this. So I'm going to just, you know, 
I can't hold you guys back anymore. We are going to have to talk about Ayers Landilar's first round knockout over Cornflake <laughs> Lamana. How do you think Lara looked as a 160 pounder? Like, do you think the knockout was a result of like the fact that he had moved up in weight, as I saw some people thinking or pontificating? Or do you think this was like a situation where you got a guy in Cornflake who, nice guy, you know, I really like Cornflake, the person, but as the boxer, Cornflake is just not able to withstand the power of an elite fighter. Yeah, probably the the latter. I mean, he got, Laura landed a bomb. Like, I don't think, you know, many guys that are coming up from 54 are taking that shot just flush like that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it's a matter of him moving up. I just think that shot was was a big shot. Tom? Yeah, I, I, I mean, my main thought on this is um, he looks strong at 160. Obviously, the level of competition. I mean, sorry, Cornflake, but, you know, <laughs> you're not, you know, Jamal Charlo. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's possibly a hint of what Lara is going to be like at this stage in his career. And I'm, you know, <laughs> a lot of this is speculation, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, it's been interesting seeing uh, Rigandau at this phase of his career, you know, just to, to, to lazily compare, you know, two Cuban southpaws. Um, but he's been less mobile, more focusing Tom, on yeah. Tom. power punching. Tom's a um, guy that compared Luca to Larry Bird. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think this will be interesting if we see, you know, we've already seen that in Lara's career. We've seen that in the herd fight, you know, less mobile, a little more in the pocket, still very sharp puncher. Um, so we'll see. Um, you know, but just another note, I mean, look, credit to Lara for getting Cornflake out of there. You know, he's done this before. Oh, I mean, he, yeah. <laughs> he fought, you know, um, Ramon Alvarez, he fought one of Canelo's brothers, blew him out, fought Yuri Foreman, blew him out, uh, fought Ronald Hearns, blew him out. Um, so, I mean, he's had some of these opponents where it's like uh, Jan Zavik, who had gone the distance with Keith Thurman, um, you know, stopped by Lara Cabrillo, completely no, blew no. him out. I think, um, I think we got backwards. Jan Zavik, uh, yeah, they there there was like oh, a, I had it right. there was like a weird medical stoppage with Birdo, but the point is, yep. uh, credit credit to Lara, he's got an overmatched guy. Just take him out, go home. You know, you don't get paid overtime in boxing. So um, that it, is I've, the perfect way to sum that one up. Actually, you don't get paid overtime. He clocked in, he clocked Lara uh, Lamana, and then he clocked out. And it was you know, again, it's it's not great. This was for like a WBA interim or regular or whatever. I mean. That's fine. I'm not going to regurgitate um, Twitter arguments, but we got to see what he looks like at 160. He got to do a camp at 160. All those things are good. I'm looking forward to his career at 160. And, you know, if that eventually leads to a Jamal fight, I'll look forward to it. I, I think he's going to... He sounded more eager to go back down, to be honest, but... He looks soft. I think he needs to go back down. Oh, again, yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch a lot of the extra stuff, so fill me in there. I don't know if that was the post-fight yeah, that in was the in the first or... fight. They asked him what he'd like to okay. do next, and he was like, you know, ideally he'd be able to fight the winner of uh, Charlo Castano. Oh, he and, wanted to go uh, down to not... 154 and get knocked out. I see. <laughs> but he also he also did say that he'd like the herd rematch, and they've been trying to make that for a while, and it hasn't uh, materialized. Uh, and if if those if either those two fights are impossible, maybe Jamal at 160. But he he also did say that Jamal is like a brother to him. But uh, in the business of boxing, sometimes you have to fight your brothers. That was kind of how he left it. Okay. Um, yeah, all right. I mean, go down to 154. I think, you know, you can... He already fought Castano. It was a draw, wasn't it? Yes. Huh? Uh, if he says... Oh, I saw somebody throwing out, like, Laura versus Golovkin. My guy, stop. <laughs> you were doing too much. Like, bro, we got two 38-year-old... <laughs> 39-year-old guys. Do we really need to see these two guys fight each other? I mean, we like, don't even need to entertain that. To That's just like right media on, people bro. who want to sh- shoehorn in the days in names for absolutely no reason in the middle of this pay-per-view. I mean, that was just stupid. Like, at a minimum, just make, like, 
how about you like use your brain and like come up with something that's a little more interesting and like we all know the situation with Golovkin. My guy is like, nope. I it's it that dude is like holding GME stock right now. Like it's like Canelo to the moon. He ain't trying to do no, <laughs> no Aris Landy Lara and get paid his minimum. Hell no. Uh anyway, do you guys think, by the way, first of all, knockout, don't care. That's my take. Um, do you guys think that as a fan? You got 50. Oh, should also mention uh, Eduardo Ramirez continues his little run. I don't know what he's done differently. but Yeah, I was hoping you were going to mention him. Smoking, dude. I mean, it's just like, what what an eventful card last night. I feel like there are so many significant wins and performances, you know, from just at all different levels. And I mean, yeah, I definitely want to continue to see him at 126, no question. Yeah, I mean, Eduardo Ramirez becoming, hopefully this is sustainable, but he is on one hell of a run right now at 126. And granted, he's not facing like no murders row. Although you could argue that a murders row at 126 just doesn't exist. Fine. But like he is one of the guys at 126 just actually showing off crazy power. And I think it's time we get Mr. Gary Russell Jr. out of retirement. Get oh, actually he uh no, no, we're we're due for the yearly Gary Russell fight. I think I'd like to see that happen. If the Ray Vargas fight don't come through, uh, anyway, do you have an update on that no. or anything? Like, is that not happening now? Or, um, me and Mister Gary haven't quite talked lately, <laughs> so I don't know. Okay, yeah, just just to say one more word about, um, uh, one more word about. Oh God, uh, Ramirez, um. Yeah, I mean, when you were saying you don't know if this is sustainable. Yeah, it's like he has the losses earlier in his career. But, I mean, this to me doesn't look like a Jorge Lara situation or anything. You know, just speaking of like a kamikaze fighter at 126 who comes in guns blazing and then gets knocked out in the first round and retires. I mean, uh, I mean, he just to me looked uh, good in this on. fight. Jorge Lara actually got shot. So, yeah. It, got it, shot by Claudio Marrera in the no, first round. No, no, no. Round. Like somebody with a pistol blasted him. A little that more to the or right after he got knocked people. out. I don't. Um, I don't really understand. I mean, I'm sorry he got shot. I don't know which part of the story that you're like disputing here. I mean, he I, was. I think there's a reason why Laura just kind of disappeared, and I don't think it was because he got knocked out. That's one of those. I dudes definitely that did I think, not know that he had gotten shot before that. Uh, yeah, he was pulling. I think the story goes he was pulling some money at the ATM. He got rolled up on, and the rest is history. Good thing he didn't lose his life or anything, but. Yeah, he got shot. Uh, October 31st, 2018, uh, which was six months after he got knocked out. So why are, like, what uh, again, I'm sorry he got shot, him. but the, I, I'm trying to make a very simple point. Lara was a, a, rec- a fun but reckless fighter and eventually got knocked out. Uh, I'm just saying that Ramirez does not look like that to me. I thought he looked... Uh, he, I thought he showed punching power and, you know, skills. I didn't think he was fighting in a reckless way. So um, it's like, yeah, he has the the earlier loss in his career, but he seems to be in a good place right now. Yeah, I, I really hope it's sustainable because it's fun when you have a guy at, in, in a lower weight class who's just like, I mean, look at the, the excitement around in a way. Look at the excitement that was that we had with Donair. Or Darchinian, when you have these smaller guys that knock dudes out you, in a way that you don't typically see in that division, it brings a lot of excitement and it also brings a level of attention to the division that typically it doesn't get. Uh, anyway, we have to. Oh, actually, a couple of quick questions here. Um, do you think the fans got fifty dollars worth uh, last night? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go real quick. Right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I. For me, the true measure of like this was a good fight is do my non boxing group chats are they talking about it? And and two of them were. They were talking about Laura, they were talking about Ruiz and Ariola. So I think I definitely think uh PVC had a hit last night. Um Tom, you wanna give some praise to the matchmakers for some of the fights last night? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I just, my my overall take on the value, I mean, I've said this before, but I just, when I'm thinking about a pay-per-view, I just think, even aside from pay-per-views, just like, is this a card where I want to set aside my Saturday night to watch it, or am I going to be catching up, 
you know, or am I going to watch like a movie with my wife and then catch up the next morning? Oh, and this like, guy's a wife. Okay. Yeah. Way to brag. Oh, but what, you know, insert whatever here. I don't know, like <laughs> Fortnite streaming or something, me, whatever me else you have going have on lives. in your life. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm not, not going to say something. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, sorry, I threw myself off with my. We're just making much, jokes, guys. We like to pick at Tom. Too much other stuff going on in the world right now. Uh, but anyway, um, no, I mean, it's just I just think like, is this, you know, an evening I want to set aside? And this was this, just from top to bottom again, even going back to the prelims. I mean, yeah, the, the cornflake fight was ridiculous, but <laughs> I definitely got entertainment value out of it. You know, I, uh, the Ramirez fight was great and, and all four on the main card. I mean, um, you know, different, different levels of things. I mean, it was clearly the biggest step up of Jesus Ramos's career. You know, he's moving forward. The Fundora fight was just all action. Um, a, 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 the, the Abel Ramos fight again, very eventful. And then, you know, we already went in at length about, uh, the value that we feel like we got out of the main events. So, um, yeah, I think it was. And I, I mean, I feel like that argument has just been clearly won. I mean, the the attitude all over boxing Twitter is basically like, I mean, it was kind of funny because people were like posting memes saying like, oh, are you going to waste your money buying the pay-per-view or whatever? But I mean, that stuff aged poorly. Yes. Like people weren't saying that this morning. Everyone was talking about what, a, you know, all of the different things that happened. All You know, it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was just an extremely eventful evening. Uh, just action all night. It was great. Um, yeah, and I actually like it was actually really entertaining, like even outside of the fights, I will say. I really enjoyed I, I loved that segment <clears throat> with Danny Marco Fraser. Antonio Barrera, Eric Morales, Mikey Garcia, and then the host. I don't remember what his name was, but I love that segment. And I w- like I wanted to get an hour of that, like the uncut version. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with WWE Network has this show called Legends Table where they'll get like three somewhat related figures, put them at a table and let them talk about things. And like, that seemed like a perfect pairing of like, you have Mikey, you have Marco Antonio Barrera, you have Eric Morales. You know, they picked about the feud between Barrera and Morales. Um, You got to hear Barrera kind of point out that Mikey's Mexican American, which is different. And we still embrace him and we love him. You got that whole conversation, which I thought was great. Like if, if they could release like 30, 45 minutes of that, Man, I would be so happy to watch that and to hear those guys talk about boxing. You'd get a level of appreciation. You'd, you'd hear boxing talked about on a level that, like, you just don't get. Especially with those three guys who those those guys can talk. They know how to how to talk about the sport, and they're all like just insanely skilled at at fighting. Whether it be Mikey right now or uh, Barrera Ber- Morales in the prime, like I, I was super happy with the like the production value of like the the clips and segments that we got last night um also uh one last thing about the laura fight that was a shit show on paper but at least laura i I thought about it because i was like oh man you know not good but the only way i can spin this is like well at least he made it quick because he went 12 rounds was it with was it vendetti yeah that was awful (laughs) <laughs> At least he just like he's like, yeah, this is shit. And I know let me just finish this real quick so you guys don't have to really talk about this and, and watch this. So uh there's one saving grace. Uh can anyway. I say something negative about last night? You could say anything negative you want. Brian Kenny, man. Like oh, he is Well, Brian Kenny, I, I mean, that goes I, I'm not gonna talk too much. And if you want to, you can, but he's horrible. Like they gotta I, I, I don't like I don't get why the producer lets him talk for 60 seconds of a round for each round about absolutely nothing. It's crazy to me. Yeah. I, I, I mean, look, anybody who listens to this podcast on a regular basis knows that we don't like Brian Kenny. We think he's awful, which sucks because Brian Kenny has a really good voice, really good presentation for, for doing commentary. The only issue is that he thinks he's doing a debate show. He thinks he's like having his podcast there. And it's like, nah, bro, you are call you're like the play-by-play guy like call to plays i mean obviously there's no plays in boxing but anyway we got to move on last question give it to me straight what is your prediction for buys tom mr businessman for, for buys um uh 
two hundred. Thousand? I'm just throwing that number out there. Well, two hundred, like me, you, and a couple of our friends, two hundred, or two hundred thousand. Boy, you have a lot of friends. No, two hundred thousand. I don't really need to parse that, but um, fine. Uh, no, I don't I think we don't this, need to. I think yeah. that's fair. People understand I, I, it's the Fox. I, I, I'll just say very quickly. Yeah, you have the Fox uh, engine behind it. Uh, pseudo Cinco de Mayo weekend. Uh, there's a long history of these um, sort of, uh, I don't want to say niche or whatever, but, you know, targeted, you know, Mexican pay-per-views. The themed um, ones, yeah. And uh, I think, you know, there's a hunger for live sports. Yeah, I, I think, um, and just, just the buzz that sports. I saw, mm-hmm. it trended number one worldwide. I mean, the, the sense that I get is that this actually did uh, catch fire, I think, more than a lot of the, a lot of the boxing world turned their nose up at it. I, I to be honest, was, a little, was I didn't have a negative feeling, but I was surprised when it was announced for pay per view. But I, I mean, I just feel like they pulled it off. Lex, yeah, I was thinking two fifty. <laughs> you guys are crazy. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I think one fifty is probably pushing it. We'll never get the numbers. I don't even know why we're asking this question. It's stupid. We'll never get the numbers. Maybe if I beg some of my uh, my pals uh, over at Fox, I can get a number of which I'd be sworn to secrecy. But it's kind of a stupid question for us to even entertain here. Anyway, I'm like excited to talk about this next subject. And also, it just makes me so sad. And that is that Joseph Parker fought Derek Chisora over in the UK on their own pay-per-view. And Joseph Parker got a decision win. You could say he escaped with a decision win. I don't know. But let me start it off with this question. Do you think Joseph Parker deserved the win? Tom? (laughs) Don't ask me. This this is my response to this. Does... um, Joseph Parker, does he uh, spiritually uh, now gain the tooth uh, British flag emoji pairing? Could that now be applied to him after this weekend and this dismal performance, even though he's not from (laughs) England? Um, No, that was a stupid comment. Uh, I I didn't watch the fight. I'll just be blunt. I didn't watch the fight. So I'll. uh, Well, you told me that before I asked you the question. I blew it. No, I was watching the YouTube prelims for PBC. Going full shill mode, so I did miss the. Uh, oh god, Parker you guys are clowns. And... Well, you guys are going to have to be host here, and then I'll give the takes here for both of you. But well, first... I already asked the question. You're the one ducking it. What was Does the, the question? Emoji you apply or not? Mm-hmm. Well, let me, let me explain. Okay, what we had here was a fight where Joseph Parker did everything in his power to lose, and. He that includes getting dropped in the first round. Now, granted, it wasn't like uh, some major knockdown or anything like that, but he went down in the first round. He looks so startled, so scared in that fight. And like, look, anyone who's followed me for a while knows that I like Joseph Parker. You know, I have been high on Joseph Parker. I remember when there was two heavyweight prospects to, to look out for. Anthony Joshua, and you know why it is the case that Anthony Joshua was a prospect and a force to be reckoned with on his way up. And then there was Joseph Parker, who, like, if you're a hipster, and I like to say that most boxing fans are hipsters, just by sheer nature that you're liking a niche sport, but I think there's a huge tendency amongst boxing fans to be hipsters by, like, oh, I follow everything, and I know the prospects, and I like the lower weight classes and all that stuff, of which... I am guilty of all of those things. Okay. And I was, I like part of me. I love Anthony Joshua. Okay. Like I'm like a stand for Anthony Joshua. Uh, but I don't like, you know, show that too much. Cause you know, some of you guys don't really like that, but as much as I like Anthony Joshua, the hipster in me just wanted Joseph Parker to be better because it's like, nah, cause He's the, 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 the underdog here. He's the guy from New Zealand. He doesn't have the Olympic pedigree. He doesn't have the size of Anthony Joshua. He's the, 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 the rougher around the edges version of a heavyweight prospect. And now we found out that when we talk about rough, we didn't realize it was that rough. Okay. But I really wanted Joseph Parker to really be something. I was really happy when he won the heavyweight title um, by beating Andy Ruiz. 
even though and that was a fight where like that was a 50 50 fight between two prospects who'd proven absolutely nothing in their careers at that point and so all this love for joseph parker has ultimately just been not rewarded in a single way because the ruiz fight he didn't really distinguish himself in that fight i mean he did the like the minimum required to get past Andy Ruiz. And then the fight with Dillian White was awful in the sense that it's like, you knew walking out of that fight, Joseph Parker's better than Dillian White. He just, for whatever reason, mentally or otherwise, could not get it together to win this fight. And in this fight against Derek Chisora, it was, I mean, I don't know. He It's like he didn't want to win. I, I don't even know how to, how to Talk about it. Like Derek Chisora, I mean, credit to Derek Chisora. You know, he's a guy that I've learned to like. Well, I first liked him and then I didn't like him. And then I've learned to like him again because the guy is just like, he knows what he is. He's going to give it a go. He's going to gas out. And then that's your opportunity. And Joseph Parker just could not seize it. I mean, it was embarrassing in the 12th round. Joseph Parker hurts Chisora. Okay, they're kind of in the center. Parker hurts Chisora. Chisora backed up into the ropes. Now, I would like you guys to explain to me what a fighter typically does in this scenario. They walk they back up into the rope. Oh, sorry, go on. No, when, when their opponent's hurt and backs up into the ropes and they walk forward and they're right there with them, <laughs> what happens next? They move their hands. They, you know, they, I don't know. They force the stoppage, right? They're yeah. just like, you, you, you'd let your hands go. Joseph Parker, and this is where I was just like so mad about the fight, has him hurt on the ropes, and he takes three steps back, and is like, what the fuck are you doing? You got a guy who's gassed out. You can hear him breathing. This, should, this is a no-brainer. You should be out here trying to stop this fight because it, was, it looked like it was going to be a close fight on the cards, and he didn't do it. And for me, like Joseph Parker, like you got the name, you got the wins, you got the resume. Like I get all of that, but that was completely unimpressive. And like where Andy Ruiz suffered an early knockdown, he made the adjustment and ultimately earned that victory. Joseph Parker recovered from that knockdown and continued to fight. I mean, I don't know how to say this. He continued to fight scared. And so it wasn't very fun to watch. Uh, and you just like, I don't know, you just don't really think much of Joseph Parker after that fight. It's like, okay, I guess I'm done with him because I can't, I just don't want to watch him fight anymore. And that sucks because you got a good, like he showed up in shape. This dude is 6'4". He was like, he looked in far better shape than Andy Ruiz and Chris Ariola, But he didn't have anywhere close to the desire that those two guys had to win that fight. And so my takeaway is I want to see Derek Chisora fight again. I don't want to see Joseph Parker. I don't even care that Chisora lost the fight. I think Chisora has earned himself another, I mean, probably not pay-per-view, although it's in the UK. I don't care if you guys have to pay for pay-per-view or not. Sorry. But I want to see Derek Chisora fight again, hopefully in a, in a, in a fight that's either winnable or, um, you know, 50, 50, and no more Joseph Parker for me. Uh, now, also, I will watch this next fight, but, you know, that's just kind of my sentiment. Uh, any other questions you guys have about this fight? Uh, any thoughts on further compare and contrast with uh, the main event on the Fox card? Um, you know, there was a lot in common going, going into it. It's kind of... Uh, I, I think Parker and, and Ruiz, probably in terms of actual accomplishments like if you strip away the names they've done something similar they both wanted the heavyweight title they both have a prominent win albeit parker's prominent win is andy ruiz and andy ruiz's prominent win obviously is anthony joshua and then you have a, a, a veteran who's been in the game for a long time with Derek Chisora versus chris Ariola. and like the difference is like ruiz and Ariola promise firepower it promised uh, an entertaining fight. And Parker and Shizora, like you looked at that and it's like, look, that's not going to be like just, it will not be appetizing to watch. 
And last week on the podcast, Matt spelled this out really quickly. He's like, yeah, these guys, this is this fight's going to suck. And it played out that way. Absolutely played out that way. And so where we could talk a lot about Ruiz and Areola, and there was so many things to talk about, it's hard to talk a lot about this fight without just being overly negative and like shitting on it. And that's not that fun. You know, does Joseph Parker deserve like a next level fight where it's like, yeah, you beat Derek Chisora. Now you got to fight this guy. Maybe, you know, but we're, it, unless he gets in there with somebody that can force the fight to be entertaining, it, it's it's not really going to happen. And the other thing is like, it's hard to do that with Joseph Parker. Cause you have to remember, this is still a big guy. This is still a guy that's physically strong and he's going to clinch. And when he wants to clinch, you're going to have, I, I don't know any heavyweight that's going to have, an easy time getting him off of them. So, you know, in terms of the comparison, you had, I mean, it wasn't even close in terms of like the two, what was promised with each fight. But I was just overall really disappointed in Derek Park or Joseph Parker, like just from what I thought of him, what, five years ago? And where he's wound up, you know, now in 2021. Okay, that's... um I mean, that's a very thorough answer. I mean, it's it's interesting, too. I mean, he had a fight in February. So, I mean, this isn't like this is coming off COVID. Against rust. Junior I mean, Fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Took his O. Oh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Junior Fall is like, if we are going to make a pound for pound list of the absolute worst fighters to watch, <laughs> Junior Fall is out here looking like Floyd Mayweather. Okay, the dude has never been in a fight that I would have ever wanted to watch again. Floyd Mayweather of horrible fights. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he fought on Showbox and yeah, did not. Did and not never impress. fought on Showbox again. Steven Espinosa was like, get this guy out of here. We ain't even playing. We'll, we'll, we'll pay first class for his ticket back to, I think he's from New Zealand. I could be wrong, though. Uh, yeah, I think so. Do, I've do, frequently do, been wrong. Yeah, no, he's from New Zealand. I'm on his box rec. But um, do, do we know what... So that's, that was sort of a leading question, but I mean, I was sort of trying to lead to... Uh, it was like, do we know what the deal is with Joseph Parker? Is it just kind of like he sort of plateaued, some combination of plateauing, and he was in a few tough physical fights and now just doesn't put the foot on the gas pedal? Good question. Um. That's a good question. I don't know. I, I, I think it's plausible that Joseph Parker got hurt in a fight and he just is not willing to put himself in a situation where he can get hurt again. I feel like we were talking about this a little earlier, but I 100% think that that is a possibility that Joseph Parker, maybe he's chinny and we don't know it. And thus far, he's managed somehow fighting Anthony Joshua, uh, and a couple of other guys you can punch that nobody's been able to fully expose the fact that this guy can't really take a shot. Now, granted, it's a heavyweight division. Like, I mean, they're everyone's chinny at heavyweight. The question is who's hittable. And he's made himself basically unhittable at heavyweight, but at the same time, like it is not fun to watch. Uh, anyway, let's move on. We have, uh, it's crazy, you know, Every hour, it seems like there's more information coming out. So like the the whole thing that I've written here, some of it may already be a little outdated. But if you haven't heard, there's like some really sad news out of Puerto Rico. And the news is essentially that one of the most promising prospects at one point in time, Felix Verdejo, he is uh, in a very bad situation. So what's happened is that Verdejo was being questioned. They were looking for him because the Puerto Rican authorities had found a body. They'd, un- they'd found a body in a lagoon in San Juan. And they identified her using dental records as a girl named Kishla Rodriguez Ortiz. And the story goes that on Thursday morning, she was gonna go and tell Verdejo the results of a pregnancy test. 
And like, this is a quote from the New York Times. Uh, they did an article on this. Uh, this, this is the quote. I told her, be careful because he had threatened her not to have the baby, that he had his family, that he is a boxer, that he is a public figure. Miss Ortiz Rivera told Nuevo Dia. So that's the mother uh, of Kishla. So a little while later, Kishla had received a call from her boss that she, uh, from her daughter's boss that she hadn't shown up for work. And that was like out of the ordinary because this is a girl that like was super responsible with her job. And then evidence came out, video evidence came out that a body had been dumped uh, over a bridge and they saw the person getting into the car. That car was the same make and model or something very, very similar to something that Felix Verdejo drives. And so that makes the connection that, okay, Verdejo may have something to do with uh, something very, very sinister that has gone on here. And so just a little while ago, it reported it was reported that he had turned himself into authorities, which has resulted in charges being filed. Uh, the charges are kidnapping resulting in death, carjacking resulting in death, and killing of an unborn child. And I could go into the details from the from the arrest record here of what it is that actually happened. And it sounds, and I'm not going to do that. You should, but if you want to go look it up. Um, this is everywhere. The new, everyone has picked up this story. Th what actually happened or is they're, they're claiming has happened is absolutely terrible. And it is as a podcast here where we have talked extensively on Felix Verdejo from being so excited about the potential of who he could be and what he could have represented could you know earning praise as potentially the next Felix Trinidad one of the most revered Puerto Rican fighters in history and to doing this it is absolutely tragic it is a terrible downfall and uh it looks like he is guilty here and he is facing potentially a death penalty case. And it is, you know, I just feel for the family. I feel for his, his daughter that we see him with on Instagram. I mean, it's just so terrible. We're not going to talk about that, you know, or get into this. This is not the podcast for that. We are not crime experts. Uh, this is a boxing podcast, but like it, it would be irresponsible of us to just ag not acknowledge that this is happening. And you should definitely, you know, if you want to find out more information, go look at really any news website right now and they will have coverage of this. This is like a huge story in Puerto Rico right now with like every uh, news outlet covering it with like an actual, like th their TV people are there and everything. So there's no good way to segue out of that. It's awful. Okay. Yeah, Some... I'll just since I'm on, I, I just yeah, all all you can really say again is it's horrible. Just you know, wish the best for the families that have been you know family members whose lives have been destroyed, and you know, I mean, it's just it's just horrific. Yeah, I mean, the, and and as you said, it, it very very fast moving story. So you know, who knows what other developments there could be in the next you know could be happening right now as we're recording this. We just don't even know yet. So it just does not serve any purpose to get into this in any more detail. Yeah. So we'll have to just, we're stopping. That's we're we're not talking about that anymore. And we're going to move on to the next subject. No good way to segue out of it. So Floyd Mayweather announced uh, on his social media platforms. I don't remember even how it happened anymore, but he announced that he is indeed returning to the ring. He will be facing Logan Paul on Showtime pay-per-view. Now, I don't want to say I told you so, but I kind of told you guys this a while back. So there are a ton of things to talk about related to this. And first of all, I think the most interesting thing to talk about is um, Logan Paul is 190 pounds. Do we think he could knock out Floyd Mayweather? No, I'm kidding. This event is taking place on a Sunday. That's not the day that Floyd usually fights. So I imagine that we are going to be expecting a much different demographic of fans. The cross section of people who's going to be tuning into this is not the same people that tuned in for, say, Mayweather Maidana. So 
What do you think about this move to place it on a Sunday? How do you guys, where do you guys sit on that one? Lex? I don't know, Tom. I was, I was looking forward to hearing your response. Curious what you have to say. I have no idea. I mean, even before <laughs> you got to the question, I was really Tom, gonna... move your mic closer to your mouth. Yeah, sorry about that. Anyway, um, even before you got um, onto this question, I honestly, that was the thing that was bouncing around in my head. Just, just again, how weird that is. I really don't have a good answer. I, I think you actually did touch on it, so I'm sorry if I'm stealing your answer, but I think it could be just to signal that, it, you know, differentiation, that this is not the same, is not Saturday night. Uh, it's not, you know, just, just, it's a separate product than Showtime's normal offerings, but yeah, I don't really get it. I mean, just on every level, I mean, honestly, it, it just, just, it, I just had the vague thought that popped in my head, like flights are super cheap right now and I could definitely get a press credential. I was like, oh, would it be worth flying down, uh, just doing, you know, just fly out in the morning, spend the day in, in Miami, uh, take a red eye back or, you know, stay in a hotel and, and come back the next morning. But it's like, no, it's a Sunday night, which makes everything so much more difficult. So I don't, I mean, I'm really interested to hear if, one, if either of you guys have an answer, because I do not get it. I do. Of course I do. You think I come to these podcasts not ready to have answers for everything? Come on now. First of all, I'll say this. I don't like it. I, well, actually, let me hedge myself. I don't know if I like it. How about that? But Like what? The Sunday? The fight being on a Sunday or the fight itself? I don't know if I like it. I don't know if I'm ready to go and say I don't like it because like what else are we doing on Sunday nights? Like we're recording the podcast. Like I got nothing else to do if we don't record the podcast, guys. Like I'm just going to be playing video games or something. All right. So it's not like I do anything on a Sunday. I don't care about staying up late because I stay up late anyway, as you do guys do. You know, I know that for a fact. Um, But here's if I try to. You know, I'm just trying to like look at it. Like, could it be the venue? I don't think it's a venue because like they could have done this fight in plenty of places. And I highly doubt that it came down to this was all we had available. They would have just moved the date. Floyd Mayweather fights when he fights. Like, because you got to remember, there's no prize fighter in the world that has the leverage that Floyd Mayweather does. He walks in the room and can command whatever he wants. And that's by nature of this is the money man. This is Floyd Mayweather. This is the guy who's broken the pay-per-view record twice. So, okay, it's probably not down to venue. And the only thing I can come up with is that there is a team of very smart people involved in this fight. And it's not the same people that are typically doing boxing. It's like, no, no, no. We've brought in like the marketing teams and all this stuff. And we've done run the analysis. And we think that this is actually going to be a better date for you than Saturday. And if you think about it, like, well, why wouldn't you do Saturdays any other time? Well, maybe people are more likely to be home on a Sundays and they think, yeah, like, we, it's, it's easier to get these people in front of a TV on a Sunday than it is on a, on a Saturday. Maybe. I don't know. Could be something that they're trying to go out. Maybe Floyd, who's a big NBA fan, doesn't want to miss the potential game that is going to be on during the NBA playoffs on Saturday and would rather watch or rather the fight be on a Sunday because the Sunday playoff games, at least the ones that he's going to want to watch, are going to be on prime time uh, in the afternoon. Maybe, Lex. What do you think about that one? I'm down. <laughs> I'm, I'm buying. I mean, like, like you said, it's Floyd. He kind of does what he wants to do. Um, I'm very curious how, like, what demographic of people are they targeting for this fight, and like, does it connect to this this Sunday date? I saw a debate. I believe it was on Twitter about will. And it's, it's a little off topic, but will the Floyd fight threaten the tank fight? And I was just thinking about how different the fan bases will be. So, uh, I, I don't think that they're going to have an effect. And like people clutch their pearls when Floyd and Connor was a little too close to Canelo Golovkin. And it's like, uh, did you look at the numbers? They both did really, really well. They both. I would say exceeded expectations. 
So them being too close to, together right there didn't really have the effect that people thought it did. So I, I imagine that Floyd and Tank is not going to, uh, there, there's gonna, there's not gonna be much of, um, they're not gonna can cannibalize each other or anything like that. I guess is the way to say it. But I, I just don't know. This is like the weirdest move, and it's a, it's a move that I'm, I'm okay with. I'm all about experimenting. Who said that Saturday was the night for boxing? It's only that way because HBO started putting fights on Saturday. I think I don't know how how it actually played out, but <laughs> let's just go with that. That's but there's no rule book that says when a fight has to be. Muhammad Ali was out here fighting on the weekday. And like when are the biggest day like the NBA's number one days for airing games, at least for most of the season, is Thursday night. Thursday night. Monday is Raw. Wednesday is AEW. You know, these are two top wrestling programs. Okay. Who says that? Saturday is the day for the most part. I mean, maybe they're saying like, look, it's going to be hard to get people to show up to the venue because COVID's about to be loosening up all around the country and people are going to be in those clubs and not watching TVs. So, you know, I don't know, but I'm all, I'm all for it. I, I ain't going to complain. Do you guys think that in terms of like the delivery of the event, do you guys think that this is going to resemble or yeah, going to resemble the Triller card? Yeah, I don't. I don't have a long answer for this, but I think Stephen Espinosa is already. Mike, Tom, what are you doing? Dear Lord, it's getting too late here on the East Coast. Anyway, um, I think uh, Stephen Espinosa has already indicated that they are doing different things with the presentation of the event. We'll see. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think the the template already was the Conor McGregor card, you know, and it's they're even going to have some of the same fighters on the undercard, you know, Batu Jack for one. You know, just basically just do a boxing pay-per-view, do the boxing stuff, do real fights, and then you have the main event is whatever the main event is. Um, you know, in that case, Conor McGregor, in this case, Jake Paul, uh, excuse me, Logan Paul. Um, that's what I would like, and I think that's a good question to see what they actually will do. Like I said, Stephen Espinosa has already hinted that. Do you guys have a take on that? I just yeah, think that I think we're going to go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. No, no, I, was gonna, you do I, what I think I said. it'll be like a thriller with class because I, I definitely <laughs> expect like some performances, some special guest hosts, um, some form of like visual, whether it be fireworks or laser show. I don't know. I, I, I expect Steven Espinosa to really do something special with this card. What it'll be, I'm not sure. But I definitely don't think it'll be as wild and like unhinged as Triller is. So I'm looking forward to seeing the presentation, and I think the undercard is going to be banging. Uh, I think it'll be something in the middle. I don't think we're going to get Floyd versus Connor, which was literally just a boxing pay per view, uh, because you didn't need anything for that fight. I mean, everybody was intrigued with Floyd and Connor. I think there may be a little bit of more spectacle here. Uh, but I don't think it's going to go the extent of Triller. Triller is trying to be its own experience, and it's cool for what they're trying to do, but that's not what they're going to be doing here. And of course, it's always just the Floyd Mayweather show, and I think we're going to get that. Uh, do you think it'll have any effect on the Triller card that's going to be the day before? Yeah, that's sort of weird that that ended up happening. Um, I don't know. You'd think they would want to move. I mean, you know, Cop put out all these weird tweets about how they were like, um directly competing or they were originally gonna do the Saturday and they moved it off because they were afraid of the Teofimo card and I'm only slightly modifying what he said because that's effectively what he said. Um you know there's there's no comparison to the magnitude of the events. I mean for for whatever amount Triller wants to lie about their pay-per-view buys, like I mean this event is just the Mayweather event is ten times bigger than the Triller event. Uh probably that's even the wrong way of expressing it. I mean it's you know, probably more than that. Um I just I don't know. I mean that's that's <laughs> I'll avoid a long rant, but I mean that's all a subset about like what's all the fake math happening at Triller and how you know how do you take uh, Teofimo Lopez versus his mandatory and try to say that that's a big pay-per-view? I mean, it's just sort of a ridiculous premise. 
Yeah, I, I don't think there's going to be any effect whatsoever because what Triller has is going to be a pretty average boxing card and they're going to try to put lipstick on it and and put music on it and and call that a big event when realistically, I love Tiafimo. He's a fantastic fighter. But this is not a fight that you can really ask people to pay for. Mostly because like Tiafimo just got here. This is his first real like all right, you're you're on your own. You've left the nest fight. And George Cambosos is somebody who we have no clue who this guy is. Nobody has any clue who he is. And so you have a real like this is top rank. Let this one go for a reason. <sighs> I just thought of a dumb joke. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt. Uh, when Snoop Dogg's introducing the fight and mentioned Tiafimo first and then mentioned George Cambosos. Are we going to get a real-time Snoop who in response <laughs> to Cambosos? Anyway, that's the end of my dumb joke. You we can might. get back to what you were saying. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, look, it's it's tough. And and Floyd Mayweather, <laughs> there, there's just... If you look at a lot of boxers today, they're, they're, we have some really engaging fighters. We have skilled fighters. But like Deontay Wilder isn't like in terms of like, can he engage a crowd and, and is just nowhere near Floyd Mayweather. Like that's really what it is. And we, we know obviously skill wise, nobody can touch Floyd. I mean, we're talking about an all time great fighter, but like in terms of just camera presence and all that stuff. So the undercard looks good. We got John Pascal versus Badu Jack two. We are going to have the return of Jarrett Hurd. He'll be facing Luis Arias. We have a slew of Mayweather promotions um, prospects making their pro debuts. I think we have Dorian Khan and uh, I think Jalil Hackett as well. There's a, there's, a, there's a handful of them that'll be making their pro debut here. What to you stands out the most on the undercard that you're at least looking forward to? Tom? I mean, for me personally, I'm looking forward to the prospects just because... It's kind of an exciting thing. I mean, they've been talking about these guys a lot. I like the um, Mayweather Promotions sort of uh, novel method of signing prospects, of basically relying on firsthand sparring as opposed to just sort of more abstract amateur accomplishments, which you never know if there's, you know, weird judging and other things like that involved there. Um, then, I mean, of course, the better Jack Jean Pascal fight. But I mean, as much, I mean, if you asked me three or four years ago, I would say that Jean Pascal, um, Badu Jack, one of my absolute favorite fighters. I just love watching that Get guy fight. Um, but now it's just, this just feels, to be honest, a little past its expiration date. I know that's, that's sort of a wet blanket answer, but um, still looking forward to that fight, though. I feel the same way. Just want to say. Damn. About the fight, that fight in particular. Lex? I'll be the what? one to pick it, though. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm excited about Badu and Pascal. I'll be the uh, one to pick. I guess so. Look at the end of the day, you know what Badu's so gonna get. You know what I mean? It's 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 the same thing every single fight that he's in. It's it's intense. He might get knocked down. He'll get back up. He'll make it's a late him rally. Struggling with to eke out a draw. I don't know. I think Pascal is gonna stop him. To be honest, but okay. And you're basing that off of what? How all the PEDs how he's old done is Badu during now? The pandemic. Badu? Badu is what like forty now. He's got to be like 40. Yeah, so how many of these, like, he, he can't have many more of those kind of fights left. So He's I, actually I think 37. Will, I think this will be the one that it, he finally gets caught. Uh, could be, could be. Um, John Pascal was uh, down in the fight with Badu, although he also had uh, Jack down. I don't know. It might still be good, I guess. Um, maybe it's unfair to say. I think this, this, yeah, this still could be good. You have two guys that are like not elusive. They throw a lot of punches, uh, and they're both guys with a bit of power. Spe especially Pascal, who appears to try to set up power shots. But I'll take Jared Hurd. Um, interested to see the next step of his development uh, under the tutelage of one, shall we say, offensively deficient coach in Kekaroma. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll talk a lot more about this card as we get closer and as more details start to come out. So we will wrap it up here. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know that there were a couple of audio issues that we had on this episode. 
Uh, so I definitely apologize for that. Craig is really slipping today. I'm going to have to uh, have a stern talk with Craig. Um, <laughs> if you don't, uh, you can definitely check out our Patreon, which is over at patreon.com slash Sunday Puncher. We have a lot of other episodes there, evergreen episodes that, um, you know, they're not like you could still listen to them, even if they were made like a year ago, because, you know, you don't want to hear what was happening in boxing. Uh, two years ago or whatever, that's probably not as fun as listening to something that's made for whenever you want to listen to it. In addition to our chat, which is great, um, we've had a, I don't know, we've been following the Verdejo stuff today in the chat. But uh, yeah, that's available to you. I think it's, I've got, actually, I got really good praise from it this past weekend, which, you know, I was very happy to hear. So Lex, Tom, I know it's late for you guys over on the East Coast, so thanks a lot for coming on. And if that is all, we will be back next week. Yeah, always fun to come on, and I'll look forward to. Uh, I mean, this will be a full week of podcasts. Uh, you oh know, enjoy the immediate reaction pod. We've got this one here. You say you're going to bring Fred on for a Canelo preview. You've got yeah. your your newest episode of the Patreon show coming Which out. Which is good. So, uh, it's real good. I look forward to it. I mean, this is not a uh, kayfabe. I, I don't know what the episode pod? is, so I'll I'll look forward to that. Yeah, I got Tim Box Aopod as well. We have uh, a mailbag pod, which we will have a brand new host come on for that one. We'll also keep that one under wraps. But very yeah, interesting. Tim Boxdale pod. Definitely, definitely, definitely subscribe to that. Um, it is. It may not be your cup of tea, which is totally fine. But definitely check it out and see if it is. Um, anything you guys want to say about that podcast? It is my cup of tea. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, um, you know, we've, we've chatted offline about it a lot, but I mean, it's, it's just like a great mix. You know, it's like Tim Boxeo for, for anyone who, who doesn't know who he is. If you're not on boxing Twitter, uh, he, he streams club shows from around the world. And it's just like a really giving guy, really giving like member of the boxing community. And the show is just great. I mean, it covers, it's like a mix of like stories from kind of the crazy world of international club fights and then gets into stuff which like helps kind of connect to the rest of like the boxing world, focusing on like uh, either guys we've been used to fighting at the world level who are kind of like fallen back down to kind of that level or fighters who are coming up uh, who, are, you know, are at that level and look like they're destined for the world class level. And also just relating when there are fighters fighting who have some kind of background that way. Like we mentioned Jesus Ramos a few times, but um, he, he directly had fought at a bunch of uh, some of the more notorious Timboxe and venues on his way up. And, you know, now he's looking like, uh, you know, a likely future world champion. So, um, yeah, it's just a great show. He could be the first guy who graduates from the, like literally on as the podcast has existed, the first guy that graduates from. Well, actually, no. I, I'm waiting for the guy that we talk about on Tim Box Ale Pod that graduates to this podcast where we talk about him here and then ultimately graduates to world champion. That will be a proud Papa moment. Uh, for me, you know, everything you said is accurate, but I, I love the Kevin stories. Uh, and if you don't know what Kevin is, Kevin is this dude uh, that we uncovered this weekend fighting on a club level show that has the sickest mullet you're ever going to see. And we, he's become an unsung favorite of the the chat this past weekend. Uh, Lex, did you see this? Who that guy with the mullet? <laughs> literally, yeah, literally the guy who just had, <laughs> had six mullet. And no other way to put it. <laughs> oh my god, the fight poster is just something else. Like the big weight in, in jeans. Like you got to respect a guy who's weighing in for a fight in jeans. <laughs> Yeah, a non heavy. Yeah, I saw a, a picture of him in the ring, and it looked like he was like cleaning up the ring or something like that. Was that what was going on? Or he was running the <laughs> raffle. Wow! So this dude went in there, smoked his opponent, and then was like, "Hey, I, you know, I, I actually, you know, I got paid to fight, but I get paid to work here too." And he started doing the raffle. Who knows? He might have been walking up and down the aisle selling popcorn too. You just gotta respect a guy that hustles like that. So shout out to Kevin. Uh, Kevin. I'm gonna try to get a hold of Kevin and try to sign him. <laughs> First name Kevin, last name unknown. <laughs> I know. Uh, it, it's just the, the Kevin does just it just doesn't match. When you see the picture of him, you would, there's a lot of names that you may think of. Kevin is not the one. 
anyway thank you guys so much for listening if you leave if you can do us a solid leave a great rating five star review all that stuff okay otherwise have a great week have a great week guys